Mark. Hey, how are you, John? What's happening? How you doing? Good. I got the talking metal mask, which I've been wearing. Looking and good. You can, it, you can put a filter in it. Uh, wow. Manufactured by a great company that my friend Joe Ryan is running. Uh, we are now selling these. If you want one, hit me up at Mark at Talking, uh, just email me, Mark at TalkingMetal.com at $18. I'll send you one out, which, you know, I'm really not making much money off them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little couple bucks on each one I'll make, but uh, they're great, <laughs> man. They're great. I love it. Great way to show your colors. Stay safe. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Talking Metal Mass. I'm going to send you one too, John. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, we who are very really happy. Who do we have on the show tonight, man? We have Randy Rand from Autograph. I've been a fan of Autograph since I was in high school. Yeah, me too, man. Uh, I became aware of Autograph with, of course, the single um, Turn Up the Radio, which I, which I had literally had on a single, a 45. Wow. Remember those things? I do. I remember 45. And, and of course, they really came to fame as the opening act on the Van Halen 1984 tour. And they were good friends with Van Halen. At least I think they were. We can ask Randy when he comes on. But they were from Pasadena, California, just like David nice. Lee Roth and the Van Halen brothers and their producer, uh, Ted Templeman. I just finished reading his book, which was a great read, John. Uh, but anyways, awesome. yeah, man, Randy Rand. So uh, autograph still going strong here in 2020. Wow. So cool. So cool. And hey, Mark, you sound great, but if you can pull your mic a little closer, I think it'd sound even better. Okay. Uh, can I turn it up? Check one, check one, check one. Is that better? Sounds good. It all sounds good, but I was just, okay. I can, okay. I, I'm up. asking you to turn up the radio, turn, turn up, the, up volume. the volume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, speaking right. of great books, let me tell you about this. I just told Mark Weiss, the amazing photographer, Slippery When Wet, Motley Crue, Ozzy Osbourne, uh, that you loved his book. You got it as a gift for Father's Father, Day. Yeah. And, and he's going to be sending me a copy. And then he is going to be coming on uh, Talking Metal Live on Facebook at some point in the future. And right. uh, it's going to be a cool thing. Well, I better read the book before then, because right now I'm just stuck on all the incredible pictures, because it's a picture book, you know, but he, yeah. he writes stuff in there, too. And it's funny. Uh, can you hear me all right, by the way? I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you great before, but just wanted to hear you a little more. Yeah, I moved the mic. It's like right in front of me right now. So, nice. Uh, good you call. got one of those cool S, it's called an S or D S or. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't it have one of those. It's screen type of thing. And what it does yeah. is it... Uh, prevents when you have a high-end mic it prevents the mic from popping when you hit those correct S's. and it sounds sounds excellent now and i haven't said the word d s or in a long time but it's like d apostrophe e s s e o yes. like taking the s sound away or p sound away you know and they have plugins now on a lot of the software that that do that too but we go old school here on talking about yeah. we oh, are what was i saying i was saying something i don't know what i what was i just you, uh about? you're gonna read mark weiss's book because the pictures are great and right now you're oh, just yeah. caught up in the photos yeah yeah the photos are are so excellent oh i was gonna say this uh this is, was cool i always get a kick out of stuff like this the official warrant uh, Instagram, after I announced on Instagram that I had the book, I get a direct message from the official warrant Instagram oh. account saying, are we in the book? Did we make the cut? Which I thought was <laughs> funny because, uh, and they did, they're in the book. Good. Not a lot because it, it warrant technically came out in 89 and the book is about the 80s so they they just snuck in there at the, the, the tell in right tell yeah, in there is some cool pictures of warren uh and bobby brown on the set of, of cherry pie and you're already drinking i i, I gotta I have oh yeah yeah let's do talking metal toast talking metal yeah. toast i have another announcement too but i'm gonna hold this up i'm gonna disrupt my display and hold up some dash vodka because we love it here on talking metal yes i've got a dash vodka dirty martini Right. This is extraordinarily smooth vodka, handmade in Texas by your cousin. Your cousins or by, by 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 the Dash Company and part oh, of the Dash sorry, Company. I, I no, no, I, I, no. Yeah, it is my cousin. I'm it, yeah, yeah, the best. Uh, vodka uh, my cousin is not making this in his house. However, he is part of the company, and uh, his name is Hank Reeves, and he rocks, and he has a good buddy named Ali, and. Uh, they are rocking this company, and I predict soon, people, 
this will be nationwide and it's gonna rock and it's gonna be the in drink and and you can tell people when you go to a bar i want to be like talking metal and drink that dash box there you go there you go because Great it's extraordinarily go. smooth it's not just slightly smooth it's extraordinarily smooth awesome got it got it and uh, i'm drinking of course uh, a stone which i believe is a pennsylvania brewery oh good uh, a double ipa which our friend so bud friendly turned me on to this particular uh Beer, the double IPA. FML. So let's do a toast, and I'm going to attempt to hit this against this without busting it, and let's make the sound. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, hear that? Oh, I just spilled it. Okay, never mind. And I kind of, I kind of rushed to the setup here. My set is not quite perfect. This is my. Uh, well, somebody said last week, "What's that pillow you have in the back?" This is a uh, the Motley Crue pillow, by the way. Which That's a great see. pillow. That's like your early. Yeah, you can snuggle Motley whenever you have the urge. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, early Motley crew. If you need my mom to get found close this. To... this is like a random present for my mom, who may I... or may not be watching right now. If you are, <laughs> I hope she's watching. Yeah. Uh, That's a great, great pillow. Right. So we are waiting for Randy Ran of Autograph. Again, a Correct. band that is still putting out music. We're going to hopefully talk to him about their new song, which John, you heard this, right? Souls on Fire. Yeah, really? it sounds great. I love yeah, it. And I, I have a couple of things I just want to tell them about the song that I think is cool. And yeah. you know what I'm doing now? I'm logging on to Facebook so I can A, make sure we're on and B. Yeah, we are. I see it. I don't okay. I don't know if we've gotten any comments yet, but uh, uh, I did yeah, want to mention, we John, we have all stars coming up on Talking Metal, which depending when I post this as a podcast, uh, they may have already aired on the on the stream on the RSS podcast stream. But listen to this: Udo Dirk Schneider, Klaus Amazing. Mine of the Udo Dirk Schneider of Accept fame, Klaus Mine of Scorps Scorpions. That is, and right first time ever with Klaus, unbelievable. And then D Snyder uh, of Twisted. Yeah, Sister, unbelievable. I've been trying to get for years. The first thing I said to D was. Man, I've been trying to get you on this show for 15 years. And he was like, oh, man, I, you know, a number of people have told me that. I, just, I'm, I don't know why I'm so hard to get a hold of. He's like, I, he, seemed <laughs> really, he seemed really bothered that, that, he, wow. that people are telling him he's hard to get a hold of. But, of course, I, immediately I was like, the first time I saw you was opening for Iron Maiden. And he, and he just, that was all it took. And he just, those were the days, man. Oh, and that's on, great. And on God. About, we got to get him on the live stream. I'll tell him about uh, when I saw the uh, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll Tour. I <laughs> love that. Yeah, you're yeah, cool. And again, guys, this is Talking Metal Live. It is on the, the Facebook page, John's Facebook page. We may someday try to stream to numerous places. On all the pages, yeah. We, we, yeah. We're going to figure that out. So we yeah. do have a few comments. We got John Ezzo. He says we're on. Thank you, John. We got Delilah Crowley of Rockstar Picks.Rock. She says, uh, I sound like a little bit like Dan Aykroyd, uh, which I love. We got Sherry. Uh, she's the, uh, Sherry, by the way, so if you're in the comments and you're looking at Sherry, she's what I call the marketing team. Uh, okay. Her oh, and Bert Michelle. Gabriel, Bert Gabriel back again watching, right? Uh, I, I don't know, but he might be. We've got Jack Lawler, who's uh, my best buddy. And uh, Sherry, I'm going to let you know how you can buy the Dash online. If possible, we're going to look into that. And uh, she's down uh, in either Nashville or the Outer Banks or both. And uh, uh, we're going to have a talking metal meeting at some point, and, and we're going to bring her and her friend Michelle into the team. Okay, <laughs> this is going to be good. Anyway, guess what, guys? Here's the thing: I used to have this ridiculous smile, like, <laughs> and right. somehow now I think my face moved down. Something happened, and when I I do these Facebook videos, it looks like uh, I got like it looks like some like like a uh, Karen Black Rocky Horror really? thing going on. Like uh, I don't know what happened in my mouth. Like my teeth moved up in my face. I didn't right. get any work done. <laughs> so well, look, your body I have your body teeth. changes and evolves over time. Yeah. So this is not my real smile, but I'm just doing this to show that there yes are teeth. All right. See, what do you think? Nice? Yeah. Are they white? Uh, yeah, it looks good to me. I'm yeah. kidding. I'm joking, guys. He can't hear you that well, but I can hear you fine, so I'm not I'm Okay. Not sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I just actually listened to the stream. It sounded okay to me, but... Yeah, Victor uh, says, John signs uh, kind of distant. Well, hopefully, hopefully not as distant now. I'll lean in a little bit. <laughs> All right. 
So we're expecting this for Randy, Victor. One guy. Randy ran the bassist of Autograph to join us in approximately four minutes. We'll see how that goes. Uh, there was a mix up earlier on the email and then he said he actually did find the email. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm psyched to, to do this. I do think we need to invite Bud Friendly back one more time. Cause I okay. feel like it was awkward to just have him that one time. And then yeah, I, we, he's in the just show. Open, I'm friends so. with him. I, I feel like I got to invite him back again. So he knows that he didn't. Well, you know, I'd love to have Bud Friendly. He could be on all the time. Yeah. So we'll get him back. I like the idea of having him in the first 15 minutes, and then when the guest comes on, it's over. Okay. Get this, John. You already know this, but get this, people watching. Next week, I mean, Mark Weiss, I can't wait for. He's a little down the road, I guess. But yeah. next week, one of the biggest heavy metal fans I know, um, and he is one of the biggest hip-hop artists of all time, DMC from Run DMC, Daryl McDaniels, who loves hard rock and heavy metal, wants to come on the show and talk metal with us because he he loves that's amazing. That. It's it's funny. that is amazing. He likes hard rock and metal more than rap, and he invented rap. I mean, it's like crazy. Right. You know? Run DMC, one of the, the the top, if not the top ever rap group, and uh, Daryl McDaniels is amazing. Uh, Mark, he was on the Grammys Christmas. this year, by the way. I don't know if you saw the Grammys, but Aerosmith played live, and of course they brought Yeah, yeah, no, I saw him. Yeah, I did see that. That was amazing. I mean, when I was in, uh, in my first job in New York, I used to show the video um, with uh, Run DMC and Aerosmith uh, to show about media arts and putting rock and roll and rap music together. Right. And that was so amazing. So the fact that he's going to come on talking metal is going to be amazing. Mark, he's your your personal friends with him. He's been to your home. Yes, he's been to the home. Uh, we've hung out. He brought me into the studio once, like this high end studio in Montclair, New Jersey. When uh, he, uh, I guess that was like that was late 2018. He was laying a, a track down, and it sounded like vintage Run DMC. I don't know what ever happened to that track. I don't think it was released, but. And he was talking about Metallica and rapping about like stuff, but it was like old school, like uh, Run DMC. And they always did like they were the really the first band to bring in that heavy guitar, like on on songs. Well, obviously Walk This Way, but Raising Hell and and uh, I'm trying to think of what uh, what was it, King of Rock. And so many yeah. great Run DMC songs had heavy guitar in it. And even Kerry King, you know, played on the Beastie Boys album played some of those guitars and a lot of people don't know know this but Daryl wrote some of that that license to ill record for the Beastie Boys some of those songs wow. were actually written by by him and uh you know he was at least one of the co-writers so I think that's uh, great slow and slow and easy or slow and low I can't remember what, but I'll have all my my facts on him brushed up before next week don't yeah worry. we have we always on brush up on stuff what's that I said we always brush on stuff brush up on things right before we do these interviews yeah. so we'll be so more going, knowledgeable what's going week. on with uh with you and ace any updates that you could give us in the next so yes yes we have, um, unfortunately or fortunately the way you look at it uh we have postponed the date in warrendale pennsylvania uh in august to april of 21 it's at a venue called jurgles and uh i can't comment on the surrounding dates uh but everybody should just stay tuned to acefriendly.com and ace Friendly's facebook and the venue websites and uh we've we postponed one date so far and hey it's randy randy uh is connecting shortly yeah. and sometimes i realize the facebook people cannot see when i see that right. somebody well, has connected. It takes a minute to connect to the audio, yeah. and once you're hooked up. Randy! Yo! Hey! Hi. What's ladies up, Randy? How you doing? Good, good, man. What's up? Cool. Ladies Mark, and gentlemen, I want to welcome to the podcast with John and I tonight on the live stream here and on the podcast on the YouTube page, a legendary guy, Randy Ran of Autograph. Randy, how are you, man? I'm doing great, man. How about you guys? We're doing good. It's been a while. I think the last time we hung out was at M3. I, we did an interview. I think it was two or three years ago we did the interview, but I, you guys played last year too, and it was just a great set. Right? Yeah, we played last year. You're right, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. you played numerous times. Always fun to see you guys live. I know there's a, 
a lot going on with the band. There's a new song, uh, just the amazing history. We want to talk to you about all of it. But I think first, John had a little story for you. Hi, yes. John. So, hey, Randy, how you doing? Absolutely. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but you really saved my job one time. Uh, and I'm going to tell you the story. You may remember. We were in an airport in Chicago on the way to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. to do Rockfest 2018 in Kadat, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I was tour managing Ace Frehley, and the band and crew were wondering, why are we going to Chicago and then flying into this small airport? And the plane from Chicago to Eau Claire was autographed and Ace. I think we had all the seats on the plane. And, and the guys were like, why did, you, why did you do it this way? And I asked you, I said, look, I know you've been doing this for many years and you're an expert in this. And you told me and you saved my job because I went and told the ACE crew and ACE himself that you said this was the right way to do it. Yeah, it was. We had been doing it a million years. <laughs> Yeah, because so what happened was we had to fly, we had to get everybody together in Chicago from parts unknown across the country, and then we had to fly all of us together on the same very small plane to Eau Claire, and then we had to go to our different hotels. But that was really the best way to get to that town where the festival was. It, it was. It was the only way. Because I've been booking flights for the band for seven years now, so it's just easier just ask me if you need anything, man. Just ask. So from, from now on, Randy, when I have a question, I'm just going to, I got your number. I'm going to call you. <laughs> did I do this right? <laughs> you did it right, baby. So Thank you. Thank so, you. So, so, Randy, we are totally psyched because recently we got a new autograph song, which sounds mm -hmm. great. I want to talk to you about this. Souls on Fire. Uh, excellent sound. It's exactly what we want from you guys. Uh, really catchy stuff. Uh, you're giving some of the proceeds, I guess, to, to charity. I want to hear about that. And my other question is, is this a, a, a sneak peek of things to come? Can we expect a full new autograph record or is this just a one-off? Well, I, well, what happened, it was going to be a one-off. And then it, I guess that's good. Um, you know, people, we get a lot of airplay too, which is nice. And so Jimmy Bell, the new guitar player, took Steve Lynch's place. He just sends us stuff constantly, constantly sends wow. us stuff. Okay, and you'll hand it to Simon, get lyrics in, and Simon's also a great guitar player too, so he adds that. And I come in and do my stuff, and Mark is an engineer plus drummer, so we, we got that all inclusive thing. And they were, they was, it turned out real well. It might be, might be another one. <laughs> right, okay, cool. So, so when you say it turned out real well, you're, you're not just talking about that, the Souls on Fire song, you're talking about a bunch of songs. Well, we've only got one in the can so far. One, so. one in the can. Okay. But yeah. there's other ideas floating around. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, the creative juices are flowing. Yeah, they are big time. Awesome. Big time. Randy, I want to tell you that when I first heard the song and, you know, listening to the, the intro and the first verse, I thought it was, you know, great classic autograph style. And then when the chorus hit and the drum beat changed to that Motown you know, four on the floor, kind of like a la Kiss Deuce beat. Um, I was like, that is so cool. And I really love that you guys did that. Not many people even today do songs with that beat where it's, you know what I'm talking about. And Absolutely. I love it. It's a drive. It's, you drive in the car hard, man. Yeah, yeah. That is so cool. And now let me ask you, who, who comes up... Uh, like, is it you and uh, the new guitarist? Uh, like, who, who comes up with the main stuff? Like, what's the writing process like? Because I love it. It, 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 it really, really depends. It's like Jimmy will start something or uh, Simon will start something. Um, or, or me and uh, Mark was sitting there just uh, jamming on something. It's like, it's, it's, that, that is the process. We don't know what it is. It just happens that way. That's so, even better. That's, that's even better yet because everybody can bring an idea to the table. And that might be why you guys are such a um, cool unit because, you know, there's not like one guy doing everything. Everybody kind of brings in their own thing and it yet still sounds like autograph. Right, exactly. It's, a, it's this is how we write. It, that's why I like our, um, our foursome. We all kind of like that same style, you know, the, the cool intros, the cool bridges, the cool, the really, really cool choruses, and, you know, and of course the guitar solo. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, the guitar solo. Forget to get. Forget it, man. When I heard the guitar solo on Souls on Fire, I was like blown away. I mean, like that literally was spectacular. Let me tell you. Yeah, we we liked it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Randy, did you feel like there? You know, with Steve Lynch leaving the band, obviously a, a longtime original member. Did you feel uh, pressure to kind of prove? Uh, things with 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 the new guitar player Jimmy uh, with this song, no, 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 no pressure. Good. I just like to move on. He wanted to move on, and so I just said, "God bless you, dude. Uh, go and do what you need to do." And uh, Jimmy Bell and, and Steve Lynch are friends, so and, and we've cool. known Jimmy for a while. And he said, you know, "Give me a shot." And I said, "We really don't have to look any further. You you can have the shot, Jimmy." Yeah, I, I love it. First rehearsal was unbelievable. It just like, okay, we're good. Hey, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm so glad that you guys uh, approached it that way, and and you guys are continuing on. And let me tell you, if 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 you guys were like, I, I would just be happy following autograph. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. I like your band enough that I if 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 COVID was going on forever, but autograph only did live concerts, I just follow you around. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and I know you did a, did you do a concert recently? I'm, 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 I thought you did. Tell us about that. We played a um, social distancing uh, concert in Colorado. And they had- That's cool. It was outside, but it was, it was a bar, but it was a big bar and they had a big outside and they had all the benches six feet apart and all that stuff. But by the end of the night, everyone, you know, they were drunk and at the front of the stage. Yeah. Well, see, yeah, I, I, I'm so glad you guys did that. And uh, I, I know there are differing opinions on it, but I'm happy that you guys went out and did that for your fans. And here's the thing. In, I live in New Jersey, and they have bars that have, or bar restaurants that have outdoor seating. And it, everybody's just kind of hanging out. And like you said, if a few drinks, people are getting closer. I'm not saying that we should forget about social distancing but nobody's saying why is i don't think there's a rule that says you can't listen to live music at the same time because people are out and doing their thing so i think it's great that you guys flew in from wherever you got to fly into and did that gig good for you it was, it was good to get on stage again because the last time we played was uh in february on monsters of rock cruise so we were like right a bit to go play again so, yeah, thank you for doing that. Randy, uh, Randy yeah. one, one, one of the, uh, I guess, really strong points in the band, for me personally, is Simon, Simon and his, his voice. I wanted to take you back to 2000, I guess, 13, when, when he first joined up with you guys. How did you discover Simon? He was, uh, uh, we were, were looking for a singer because Steve Plunkett didn't want to do it, the original singer. Right. Because he's doing commercials and all this stuff, actually making a, a good living. <laughs> and so he said he didn't play live anymore. So that was okay with us, man. It, this is all friendly. And uh, we were looking for a singer, and um, someone said, well, try out this guy. We saw him on the Monsters of Rock cruise with uh, Jailhouse. And I said, okay, we'll try him out. I looked at him. I went, okay, cool. And uh, we met up in Arena Del Rey, where I used to, to live, at a bar. And um, first, of <laughs> all, first of all, we walked in, and not one girl is planet looked at me they just looked at him and i said that's our front man right <laughs> <laughs> so that, that i was, love simon he's great oh he's a great guy man a uh, really really cool guy good lyricist good great singer good, good, good and good. you know what i think is cool is not only is simon a great singer and great guitar player but uh the 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 fact that um steve plunkett it, is still friends with you guys and uh, everybody's cool it's like there's no like weird feelings. Like uh, it's just, he's, Steve is doing his own thing in a different world and writing songs for commercials and other stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody's cool with it. That's nice. Absolutely. It's like, we went through the battleship of, you know, going through Van Halen and Motley Crue and all those tours and waiting to get a hit song. I mean, there's kind of a kinship there, no matter what anyone says, you know, it just is. Right. Right on. And you guys, you and Steve Plunkett go way back. Way back. A band called Wolfgang, right? Yep. Which uh, Kevin Dubrow, uh, you know, rest in peace, Kevin. But he once was quoted saying that that Wolfgang, which was in the same scene as as Quiet Riot and Van Halen before you guys were all famous, 
uh, would would blow both Quiet Riot and Van Halen off off the stage. Uh, I, I I would like to be modest, but I'm not. Um, yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Good for you. <laughs> and what were those days like? Can you describe the, the the scene back then? Are you from Pasadena originally, like the Van Halen guys? Here's the funny thing: none of us are from Pasadena, but that's just uh, that's just in our, our bio. I don't know why it's there. We keep okay. trying to take that, <laughs> but it, it just keeps coming back at us. No, we we knew all the guys in Van Halen. We knew all the guys in Quiet Riot. It's just we kind of grew up together. You know, knew Randy Rhodes, knew knew everybody. So I did a bunch of stuff with Frankie Benelli. It's that was a good time in the seventies. It was fun. That's and, cool. And do you, uh, can you share some memories of opening for Van Halen on that 1984 tour, which was when a lot of us really became aware of Autograph? Was that dating back to your, your friendship and your, your, your acquaintances from, from the 70s with the Van Halen guys? It, it had a lot to do with it, but it also had a lot to do with me and Plunkett and other people. We, we've been working on demos forever. Well, when I was playing, I was playing with Lita Ford at the time, doing her second album. And our drummer, Kenny, who's passed away, right. uh, was a jogger with, um, with David Lee. And uh, he heard our, our tape and he said, you guys want to go on tour with us? And so I get a call in, at the power station in New York from Plunkett going, want to go on tour with Van Halen? I said, uh, yeah. So when, I got <laughs> to, so when I got back to California, I didn't even know three of the guys in the band. Um, I just knew Plunkett. We had three rehearsals. We got in a Winnebago and drove to Hollywood, Florida from uh, Burbank, California. Oh my God, wow. And our first gig was in front of 14,000 people in Hollywood, Florida. Wow. That is amazing. Okay. So just to back up a little bit. So you are in the studio, in the world famous Power Station studio where everyone from uh, clapped into, you know, Duran Duran. I mean, it's just amazing that people have recorded there to, to Chic. You're recording there with, get me, uh, set, set me straight if this is not right, but with Lita Ford at that time. Yeah. And you get a call, hey, let's get Autograph going uh, again, or what was? What no, was no, we, did, we didn't have a name of a band yet. We, we, wow. made, up, we made up the name in the Winnebago because we had like three and a half days to get there. So, so Steve wow. Plunkett calls you and says, do you want to join a band with us and we're going to go on tour opening for Van Halen? And we have, and we have no name. Um, I, I just got off tour with uh, Lita playing with Rainbow and Black Sabbath. So I, I, I had a three piece band. It was me and Lita and Randy Castillo. Wow. So, wow. so we had, um, I, I was already ready to kick ass again because I was playing in Europe and those are rough crowds, but I liked them. And so <laughs> I was ready to get back out again. I was, it was fun. Wow, that's, that, that, that is amazing. And yeah. so did you have to, did you go straight from New York to Hollywood, Florida, and those guys drove back, or did you meet them back in California and go into Winnebago? I had to meet them in California because we had to rehearse because I didn't know the guys. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I didn't, I didn't want to take the Winnebago, but, but I did. I had to be. Well, good for you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a fun thing, especially for a new band. I mean, but driving from California to Hollywood, Florida is a hard drive, and, and that's amazing. But, I mean, knowing that you're going to be on tour with Van Halen playing for 14,000 people on your first gig is unbelievable. And I've had little bits of cool stuff like that happen to me in my life. And, and to me, I think that's amazing, and I, I, it's such a great story. And, and look, it, 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 it proved successful because it, when I was in high school, Randy, um, one of the, we didn't even have cable TV like where I lived. And when we finally got it, one of the first music videos I ever saw was Turn Up the Radio. And so you guys have been a part of my life from the beginning. So That's I cool. love it. And then it's still around. The damn song is still around and doing well. It's a great song and, and good for you guys that... That's such a, a, I mean, not many people have a song that good that sticks around all these years. Yeah, trust me, I'm happy. That was one of my bucket list things. Get something in I the love top. it. <laughs> no doubt about it. So, so, Randy, I do want to jump back more to contemporary times, but uh, just be, you know, that was when Van Halen was as big as they got. In 1984, obviously, they were already big, but then Jump just really yeah. made them a household name. Any memories of, of hanging out or partying with the Van Halen guys on that tour? Were, were, they, were they with you guys a lot? Like, how, how did that play out? Well, um, 
we were kind of separated a lot. I, right. I think because they didn't want the two bands because, well, we can talk about the drugs and the alcohol and stuff. They were trying to keep some people away from other people ever doing them. <laughs> right. So there, there was that. And, uh, but my best story is with the night we played Madison Square Garden in front of 20,000 people. That was our last night on the gig. And wow. the president of RCA Records came back and said, don't sign with anyone else. Three record deal, $3 million deal. Don't sign with anyone. Come back in my office tomorrow. Wow. Wow. I know. <laughs> that is amazing. I mean, bucket list, bucket list. <laughs> right. Randy, you, you, I, I just, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I was happy uh, hanging out with you guys before, but now just after hearing all the great stories, I just feel like I want to get back on tour and I want to go to where you are and hang out. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> So in 2013, Randy, when you guys first start putting autograph back together, um, Kenny, who you mentioned earlier, Rich, Richards, uh, he is involved initially in the in the kind yes. of reformation. And what happened with with that? He didn't work he, out, or his, his body just couldn't take it anymore. He right. had a bad back, and it was like got the three songs he's done. Okay. And so he said, "We well, got got to do more than three songs. <laughs> so we have to get somebody yeah. else." Yeah, and then he sadly left us, I guess, about about three three years ago at this three point. Three or four years ago, yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so he, sad, but it, it, I was just going to say, you guys really him. liked him. He's a great dude, and you guys, you know, I think we're probably close all the time, no matter what. Yeah, but we, uh, like, me and Lynch talked forever, because we were roommates a lot on, on the road. Me and Kenny, we had our problems, because I'm a bass player, and he's a drummer. We had meter problems. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> right. So I say, and uh, so <laughs> sometimes we've got him roused, but it was okay. We still love the guy. Right, right on. So obviously, we're most. I mean, you're you're doing. You did a show, but most shows uh, are canceled for the immediate future. What does 2021 hold for Autograph? Are you are you gonna guys going out and touring again? What do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, we got, we got plenty of stuff. A lot, most of the stuff that's postponed is just set to next year, on, almost on the same dates. And what about M3? You guys are scheduled to play that this year? Is that no, correct? Not, not this year. No, that, we, it's every other year for us. Just every like other the, year. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, cool. It's like the cruise. Yeah. Randy, I wanted to ask you about the, the label, the EMP Music Group, uh, David Ellison's label. So you guys work with them. Are you planning to put more stuff out with the EMP? Yeah, of course. As long awesome. as they now, how did you work. hook up with, did you know David Ellison? Uh, like, how did you guys and him hook up? Uh, I don't laugh. I don't know. <laughs> I just knew they were such a contract. This was, it, was, it was someone in wow. the band that doing really, I can't remember. And cool. Yeah, guys, I'm not, well, he, he's a great guy. We, we, we're good friends with him. And uh, I, I love that you got, you know, I love that he has a label. And I love that his label doesn't only pick bands that sound like Megadeth. You know what I mean? He, he's got like a, a different roster of groups. And that's what I think is great about a rock and roll heavy metal record label that you you don't just pick like the group that you sound like. And, and I love the fact that you guys are on that label. Yeah, me too. It's great. Great, great bunch of people. Cool. And Randy, what kind of basses do you play? What's your rig? My rig right now is, um, I got this thing. It's, it's a Dean bass, but it's a, a, a pro. And it is killer, man. It's, I, I haven't had a bass quite this nice in a long time. It, and I also use SVTs, old school. Yeah, right SVTs, on. yeah, Ampeg, Ampeg SVTs. Uh, do you use the, like, those 810 cabinets? Uh, yeah, that's, that's all I use. Yeah, yeah, th those are amazing. Yeah, th those are well, I, classic. I don't, I don't have to move them, so it's all right. Oh, good. Yeah, you. Yeah, if you don't have to push them, that that's good. <laughs> I did that. I did that you, in the seventies. The crew does that. Yeah, you you don't. You're past that. Yeah. <laughs> now, S I love it. Yeah, you can't get better than Ampeg SVTs. That's, that's the number days. one. Yeah. So, so Randy, we'll let you go soon, but before, before we do, you've had such an amazing career spanning decades, uh, and you've shared some incredible stories with us tonight, but what, what is the career highlight for you? Is there one moment you can point to and be like, wow, that was awesome? American Bandstand, twice. Right, wow. Wow. Right. <laughs> that was something what? I wanted to do as a kid, and I got to do it 
and plus Madison Square Garden, um, on and on and on. I've got a lot of them that are just really great moments, but uh, American Bandstand, that was way on the top of my bucket list. And I got to do it and twice. You, so. And what was Dick Clark like? Did he talk with you guys backstage at all? Really super nice guy. His wife was super nice. I wanted a beer, so we went down to the liquor store and brought, brought us back a six pack. It was awesome. <laughs> That is, that, I swear to God, Randy, that might have been the coolest story that anybody on any talking metal for the last 15 years told us. Hanging out with Dick Clark and they went and got you a six pack. Twice. That is amazing. I'm not Wait. kidding. You can't get any cooler than that. So the first oh. time was you, you played Turn Up the Radio. What, what did you play the second time you were back on? Um, I'm trying to remember. I was um, Senator to me, I think. Or, okay. Yeah. Maybe send it to me. I, I gotta I look that up on YouTube and find yeah, look, that. Yeah, look that up. No quicker than I will. I should yeah. look that up so I can answer that question. Too. <laughs> that's an amazing story. I mean, Dick Clark. I mean, that's music royalty. And the fact that you had like a little personal connection with them there too is so cool. And they brought you back twice, which is even solidifying the deal, saying that this is a band worthy of doing this and. And you guys are, and and that's great. And I've been a fan, like I said, since like the the eighties when I was still in high school before I graduated well, in nineteen eighty seven. Kind of yeah, that kind of stuff just makes it a lot funner to be still around. You know what I mean? And people still go, I remember that. Now I like the new stuff, and now we got some like eighteen year old fans and twenty year old fans. So, okay. Right. I, yeah, I was going to say, I bet you guys have people that are into metal now that just know the current band and they don't you know they maybe never saw autograph back in the day but they're just fans from all the m3 festivals you've been doing and and other current gigs so like you have a whole new generation of rock fans following you it, it doesn't suck i love it a lot it's great it's awesome well randy it's been an honor talking with you man we wish you the best of luck where's the best place for people to get in touch with you on social media it is uh, autographband.com. You can find our touring thing, got a store there. We got a little history and we got, you know, all, everything else that you needed and a website. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, we hope to see you back out on the road, if, you know, soon. If uh, maybe 2020, we can get 2021 on the East Coast here. We'd love to see Autograph back playing with us. But we still have six more gigs this year, so we'll see. Yeah, I, I, hey, Randy, I'm I'm uh, I'm getting antsy here in uh, New Jersey. I'm maybe I will fly out to one of your gigs wherever it is. Uh, if, if, if it's if it's happening, I'll fly out. All right, cool, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right. Best Randy, you, thank Randy. you so much. Anytime, guys. Nice and let you. me tell you, I'm not kidding. You, I think you saved my job once because of that flight situation <laughs> it's just that i'm kind of dry it's like don't if you're going to ask me a question i'm going to give, give you an answer and i think that's how i was with you i'm going this is how it's done <laughs> yeah, i love it thank you thank you all right very good awesome randy thanks right, so much safe, brother. Randy. we hope to see you soon all right buddy thank you very much take, take care. care thank you thank you for joining us have a good night Bye. you too all right randy rand ladies and gentlemen from the band autograph awesome here on Talking Metal. And I got to tell you, just uh, always, always fun to connect and talk with people who we've been fans of so, for so many years, John. I know. Yeah, I, I swear to God, I, I was my, my friend, Mike Corsi uh, of uh, Winburg, Pennsylvania, uh, who was uh, m my favorite guitar player. Um, Brian Borges also became my favorite guitar player, too. And um, Mike, he had a, he was the first, actually the second person I know to have a Jackson guitar and his favorite, one of his favorite guys was Steve Lynch. And so that's how I got to know about Autograph. And, uh, you know, Steve Lynch is a great guy. Uh, you know, I love, I, we, we, when we interviewed Autograph last together, Steve was a guitar player. He's a great guy. We wish him the best and, and we wish Randy the best is and in, in the current lineup and uh it was fun hanging out with them and when i say that i really enjoy hanging out at these festivals it's a fun thing Wh whether i'm hanging out as a fan or hanging out no, as when a you hit your hand on that thing by the way it, it sounds it's like boom boom boom, boom. it's really oh, when really i touch loud. that thing yeah, okay yeah, yeah so just, just okay how about this boom no <laughs> <laughs> okay so 
How about now? Is it okay? Yeah, no, it's good. I know when I move in my chair too, so, but yeah. Cool. So I was going to say that it's just, um, it's fun to be at these festivals, at these gigs. And I love the fact that there are people who still love heavy metal and rock and roll. And, you know, it's a cool thing still. Yeah. All these years later. Yeah. Well, I like, I like what Randy said at the end of the interview that, you know, to, to see 18 year old fans, I really think that's important. And that if this music is going to carry on, we need to uh, we need to really bring in the the younger crowd. And whether uh, that's bands like Autograph putting out new music that's going to appeal to them, or still playing their classics, I think that's great. Or newer, younger bands uh, embracing uh, hard rock and heavy metal sounds. I think we we really need more of that. And um, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I do think. There's some hope out there, some glimmers of hope among younger artists lately that I've been checking out. And sometimes, you know, they, they combine different styles and put them together and come up with something new. And, and I, I've heard some bands recently that are pulling from traditional heavy metal sounds and incorporating them into new sounds. And I think that's just great because I think that's what we need to keep uh, rock alive. You know, and I, I think we're at, we're at a really interesting point in rock history where honestly as somebody who studied this stuff for so long i could see it going either way i could see it you know this is the last hurrah and it, it kind of dies dies out as these rock stars die literally or it or it continues to grow and, and new 20 something kids continue the breathing life into it and taking it to new places. So we'll see, because I do feel like we're really at a crossroads here um, in history. That's the, I don't know, that's how I feel. What do you think? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough thing. I mean, are we gonna ever get another guy who had the same, and, and this is even going back prior to heavy metal, but are we gonna get a new Robert Plant and a new Jimmy Page both liking something and meeting up and then creating like the the next greatest coolest sound i don't know yeah but, we um, might i just don't think it'll be it'll be like if if you got two guys together a singer that was awesome a guitar player who are awesome just like uh, they write songs that are awesome it's never going to be unless they're doing something different they're never going to be greater than what led zeppelin did you know what i correct. mean because right. because led zeppelin they they went to new places and they 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 they, they were the innovators really you know i right. mean you know and right. then some people would argue that and say well you know humble pie did it before them or but whatever i mean zeppelin zeppelin right. took it to the masses and put their own spin on it and then you know kiss the stones um you know even iron maiden i mean maiden's a great example because with each album when different people would come into the fold the sound would change and there was there was right you know, sure steve harris wrote you know 70 percent of the songs but those songs were interpreted interpreted differently when you had paul deano in the band versus bruce dickinson versus right. Dennis stratton and and you know uh, yannick and and so so i i, I think um I, I, yeah, I, I, it's just, you know, it's just been such an amazing ride so far with rock and roll. I kind of lost my train of thought. The, the double. No, but you know, you were right. You were like, you were like, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, here, here's you know. the thing. Yeah. They, they would have to do something different than what we know, as opposed to two great people who met up and are copying or maybe attempting to copy right. or even inadvertently attempting to copy a style that we love so like take for example um uh i i don't know you got you you, I, you or emily interviewed dirty honey are they a young band or i mean they're young kids right or young yeah, guys yeah, they're they're young guys probably like early 20s um and they're they're they play traditional rock and roll and they play it well and they're young and they're sexy. You get out there, they can take their shirt off. They don't look stupid, you know, like a right. sixty-year-old man standing on stage with his shirt off is not sexy. I don't care. I don't yeah. care. I don't care. I, yeah, I, I, I don't care who, yeah. who you are. That's just not. That's not. That's not something. 
I want to see, and I'm a guy, right. and it's definitely not something that that some like girls want to see, right? Yeah, that some that some you know seventeen year old girls want to see. They don't want to see that. That that's like, oh god, grandpa. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's it's just it's so. But Dirty Honey, yeah, they're young guys, and they they have an amazing stage presence. Uh, they are so good on stage. Um, they suck you in. However. They're not doing anything new, man. I mean, they're, they're, right, right, they're right. Like, That's what I'm saying. Right. Right. Aerosmith did it better in the '70s, you know. I, right. And, and right. Aerosmith was again a band that that uh, pushed the boundaries and invented the shit. Having said mm-hmm. that, I have the utmost respect for Dirty Honey because they're picking up that torch and they're 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 not old and they they have the ability to reach a younger crowd. Now, I'll, I'll give you this example, which I've probably told you before, but my kids. When I was like, uh, you know, I took them to see the Spider-Man movie and they were bitching and moaning. They were like, Spider-Man, that's that, that's that old guy that dad likes. That, that's no oh, right. Spider-Man. And then, then when I got them to the movie theater and I forget the actor's name that currently plays Spider-Man, but they saw, you know, he's a guy in his 20s, but he was playing a kid that was in high school. They were like, Oh, we didn't know Spider-Man was a teenager. They thought he was so cool. They thought he was like an old guy. Yeah. They walked out of the movie theater going, Spider-Man's awesome. But if Spider-Man in the movie would have been a, a 60-year-old dude, you know, they would have been like, oh, Spider-Man's lame. You know, it's just <laughs> how it is, unfortunately. And it pains me to I know, say that and I'm getting older. But yeah. here's the weird thing. We're getting deep on today's Talking Metal. Here's the, the thing, and you, you brought up, this is a, a breakthrough moment for me, thanks to you. Um, no matter how great and how cool any new people who are 20 have an upbringing and whatever trials and tribulations they go through that causes them to have the same emotions that Robert Plant or Jimmy Page had when writing Led Zeppelin songs, uh, where are they going to go? Here's the thing. You, if they're going to go Led Zeppelin style, I don't think you can do it better than Led Zeppelin. Uh, Led Zeppelin. They're going to go Aerosmith style. You can't do it better than Aerosmith. It, it, you know, they're not going to do Beethoven. Uh, are they going to, yeah, what are they going to do? Is there a. Yeah, you can't do Kiss better than Kiss did in the 70s. Right. Uh, you know, and no disrespect to, to you know, these guys, Tom, Tommy and Eric, because I, I, I love right. them. However, there was something magical about Peter, Ace, and, Ace. Dean, and Paul, and you're never going to duplicate that. Uh, in in its magic and you're never going to duplicate what the beatles did and because they they were pushing the boundaries of of what what we knew uh music could sound like and 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 again i'm all for i mean even you know autograph for example i am 100 percent behind a band that has one original member which is randy in autograph because they're out there still delivering what what they did in the past, they're keeping it alive. I, and anyone who's from an older guy to a younger guy who's out there doing it, I have the utmost respect for. But for the for the younger kids who are out there doing it, uh, listen, we need you, and I, I give them one hundred percent praise. I, I you know, there's this this chick, uh, Poppy. Have you heard of her? Mm-mm. Yeah. So I, I I you know I'm working this new. Well, I'm I'm working on some new ideas, um, and we were told to uh, for this potential new project I'm working on uh, to you know well what 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 younger people out there are are kind of could be considered metal. So somebody suggested Poppy, and I have to admit I started listening to her her new record. Uh, and she's a 25 year old chick, and she'll one second sound like Ariana Grande, the next second she sounds like Corn. And the next me- second, she sounds like the Beach Boys. The next second, she sounds like Kiss. It's like, it's, it's absolutely wow. schizophrenic stuff. I'm going to check it out. But, but it's interesting. It's interesting stuff. And I give her credit, too. I give anyone out there who is, uh, you know, playing real music, you know, and, and taking it to, to a new place, not just a bunch of samples thrown together. And, right. you know, and as much as I love hip hop, yeah, the- I, I do like singing, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, the, the question is, and I, I want to revert back to one of the things you said as a funny little uh, aside, I will say, or sidebar, as Lance Ito would say. Um, 
<laughs> like the question Lancito. is like what yeah you remember lancito judge <laughs> lancito? yeah i'm probably the only one watching who remembers lancito yeah. but yeah the, I, he's the oj uh, judge, judge yeah. right yeah. yes oj simpson so anyway <laughs> you know what, what are we gonna do like okay is there going to be a new style of metal or are you going to bring in more technology is there going to be somebody that comes out with something different i don't know see part of me wants people to come out with more rod stewart aerosmith kiss led zeppelin but sell. you know what that's been done already and maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong and maybe i should wish people would come out with something different and new i don't know it's it's, it's i think it's an exciting new time and it just hit me today that that maybe maybe there's maybe it's time for something new to come on but people like us can still like what we like and uh follow the bands that we like like autograph who play that style of music i don't know yeah well the internet's an uh, interesting place too because in some ways you know with the downloads and the streamings it really killed the business you know but in right. other ways it allows these subcultures of of music so you can be like a band like dirty honey or or crash diet or like a traditional sounding rock band and, and you can exist in this this world because of the internet so because you can reach so many people where whereas in the you know in the in the 70s or 80s you could have never done that you know because right. it wasn't that reach and there's all these subcultures of things so no matter what you're your musical fetish is you can find it online you know it's going to be mm -hmm. uh, that's be a great quote mark you should write that down no matter what your musical fetish is you, yeah, you can it, find it online young that's band out quote. there doing doing iron maiden style and and there's going to be a young band out there doing you know aerosmith style aka dirty honey and there's going right. to be bands out there that are doing trying to push the boundaries you know but uh, it's 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 you know, there's pros and cons, I think, because I, I do think that with MTV in the, in the 80s and 90s and, and in the 70s, FM radio and, and print magazines and stuff, there were so few outlets. But if you could break through to those outlets, if you could get on the midnight special, if you could, you know, or, or in Kiss's case, the Ho Paul Lynn Halloween special, you you suddenly or ed sullivan in the 60s you yeah, suddenly yeah. got thrown into living rooms and 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 pop culture immediately like it was like a snap of the fingers you know and, and you were you were there you were whereas today i'm not it's harder for that to happen because we don't have the big media outlets that at least as far as entertainment goes that we we used to where and that's how people were like, well, how did, how did Warren uh, suddenly get replaced with, by Alice in Chains? Well, it was because a handful of people at MTV, this outlet that, that millions and millions of people watched every day, suddenly you know, changed guard or got sick of that stuff and said, eh, we like that stuff better. You know? and, and, right. and it changed, and it changed just like that. It would be harder for that to happen today because there is nothing out there that comes even close. Love it or hate it, what MTV was in the 80s and the 90s, there's nothing that musically has the influence that people are like, what about YouTube? No, 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 YouTube no. Has, has, has 10 billion videos on it. There, there's, right. MTV played the same freaking 15 videos over and over and over again. You know, and then they drop one out and put a new one in rotation. You know, it was, it was like, the the power that that had uh back in the day was was incredible absolutely and uh mark i think we we uh took a uh, a new turn today and did uh something that we haven't been doing and we actually talked about a, a serious topic and i'm happy we did that and uh absolutely. i think it was inspired by the great interview we just did with randy from monica you ran legendary guy for sure and yeah uh, let's talk about your guitars though um okay you want to do that or you how are you yeah doing? let's do it i just got beer. somebody was trying it. to call me and I'm, oh, I'm trying to think oh i swear to god i heard a, i heard a call and um and because i have my phone in another room and uh it's uh it, it i just got a text from ace Frehley. And uh, I, I have a, a, a feeling that that call was from him, and uh, he must not be watching Talking Metal Live at the moment. 
<laughs> but Jerry Adams yeah. is. Remind me. We, I met oh, Jerry I love Adams. Jerry Adams. Jerry yeah, Adams Jerry is Adams. the coolest. I met him up at the uh, four by was it four by fate? four by fate show? Yeah, yeah, four by fate show in Poughkeepsie. In Poughkeepsie, that you and I drove up to. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So who Jerry, is Jerry Adams, Adams is remind me who Jerry Adams is. Jerry Adams is a legendary guy who was best friends with Guns N' Roses in the early days, and he was a uh, pr I, I don't I, promoter slash bodyguard slash just bed best bud of all great people back in the day and still to this day, like Axl Rose slash Ace Frehley, you name it. And um, I just love Jerry Adams. And Jerry Adams he actually booker? booked he book us. Shows? He books shows? Or he books shows. He, he did security. He booked shows. And he actually booked the Captain T and Astronomy gig at downtime. Remember okay. that? Yeah, that's that's why I know that name. Yeah, okay. yeah, and yeah. Jerry Adams is amazing. One of the greatest guys ever. I, I last hung out with Jerry um, uh, when Like It and Ace Frehley were playing at the Chance in Poughkeepsie. We may might have even hung out after that, but we definitely hung out at that gig. And um, I love Jerry Adams, and I will always love Jerry Adams. He's a great dude. Yeah, Jerry says, "What's up, guys? Happy Fourth of July! Happy Fourth of July to you!" Happy sir. Jerry! Happy Fourth, Jerry! Let's hang out when uh, we can. I'm ready to hang out with anybody right now. Let me tell you, COVID or not. I let some random person put on my glasses. Oh, I was going to tell you that. Ariana Grande once came up to me. You were just talked about Ariana Grande. And I've actually been in situations with her uh, more than one time. And I'll let you people do the research on that. And I don't want to expand on that right now. But um, she she once was like, give me the glasses. And she put them on. So we, uh, there, you know, I don't know if there's any footage of it, but uh, Ariana Grande well, once like, where the astronomy. Where where did this happen? Like was this a did she, was she a Nickelodeon girl or she she was a Nickelodeon person? Right. Yes, yeah. So she started in Nickelodeon. Yep, mm -hmm. she was on and uh, yeah. that might have happened either in Los Angeles or in Washington D.C. And um, so I've been with Ariana Grande either in Los Angeles or Washington D.C. Not like me and her were just hanging out, us two together, but we've our paths have crossed. And uh, she, uh, what, she said a couple of quotes, like uh, she said something about uh, a positive quote, and I don't, it wasn't the word swagger. It was just something like uh, you got a good vibe with the crazy long hair and the suit. Uh, wow. You know, I used to wear suits. And then there was another one where she just uh, took the glasses and tried them on and you know, was doing the astronomy thing for a little bit. So that was wow, cool. That's crazy. Brush with Isn't greatness. That yeah, it's a brush with greatness. Yeah. We didn't even plan that. That was an unplanned <laughs> brush with greatness. Great. That's a great story. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to steal. That's usually reserved for you. And I did a brush with greatness by accident. Yeah, I'm not sure I have one quite that cool. But yeah, um, let's talk about guitars. I'm going to grab, uh, Okay. Uh, I had my IPA. I'm going to grab a Bud Light. And I'm going to come back in about 20 seconds. And then let's talk about your guitars. Okay, I'm going to go get a guitar while you're doing your thing. And I'll be right back in 30 out? seconds. Pick one out? Or do you have one? I'm going to pick one out. Okay, I'm going to pick one out right here. Pick one out. I'll be right back. Hi, friends. I'm back. I got a guitar. Let's see if there's any Facebook people uh, watching. Okay. Okay, let's see. We have, I'm going to hit refresh. Okay, uh, I can't, <laughs> I just refreshed my Facebook. Uh, I love that kiss shirt, Mark, by the way. This is an exclusive for the garden show, by the way. Nice. Yeah, this okay. is. Okay, Rich St. Van. He says, gentlemen, one of my favorite people uh, who lives in the area is Rich St. Van, and he's a, a Rich course, Saint friend Van. of the- That sounds like a rock star, man. Yeah, he, he is a rock star. He's friends with the Ace Frehley crew and Ace himself, and he lives near here, and I literally want Rich St. Van to be here one of these days. We got to do a thing like Talking Metal, like when COVID allows that, and even if it doesn't, I'm ready to do it. We have like some Talking Metal people hanging out. All right. So Rich St. Van, if you're up for it, you're going to be the first guy. Um, Sherry, 
Like, I could foresee side? us, depending on what's going on, I could foresee, you know, August, you know, getting back together. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe sooner. Michelle Stark and Sherry, uh, you guys are watching. Thank you. The Talking Metal Marketing Team. Uh, we got Rich St. Van. Uh, see, I can, I can see like four comments at a time. We got 55 comments. That's good. Let me see if I can hit them all. No. Okay. Um, let me try to read some of the names. Michelle Stark, Sherry. David, Rich, Jerry Adams, Delilah, Tony, a uh, guitar player from PA, Ace, uh, Ace, like you know, influenced by Ace, great guitarist, got a lot of cool gear, great Grandma stuff. Mash. I love Tony, Tony G. I love Tony. Grandma Brian Mash, Borges, keep rocking. Who's that? Grandma Mash. Oh, is she on? Yeah, and Snook. I don't know who that is. Oh, that's awesome. That's my grandmother Mash and Snook, my uncle Snook. Yeah, I, 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 are I they in the dad. comments? Your dad posted that. Sean oh, Burns great, great. Send Sean this out. Baker. This is dedicated to this is dedicated to Grandma Mash, Snook, Uncle Jim, Kathy, and uh the whole Mash family. My mom and dad as well. No doubt about it. In Ogletown, PA. Winber and Ogletown, and Ralphton, dedicated to Ralphton in Somerset. Awesome. I can't see those comments. Yeah, it's weird. I can't, because when I had my iPad the other day, I couldn't. Um, but on my phone, for some reason, I'm able to scroll back and read the comments. Uh, Sean Baker of the Sean Baker Orchestra. Sean, yeah, awesome. Love his Sean music. Baker Orchestra. Oh, Carol, let me tell Carol, if she's still watching, I will get that hat out to you. I, uh, long story, I'm going to call you, but uh, the hat will be in your hands in like by Wednesday, maximum, maybe Tuesday. So Carol, thank you. Also from PA. Uh, Bert Gabriel, Dave Arnold, who we got to have you here with us one day. Uh, John Ezzo, Jack Lawler, uh, Fernanda. And 40 more, like my Aunt Patty, also dedicated to my Aunt Patty B. Cool. A lot of people checking in. So, John, I want, to hear all, people. I want to hear all about that guitar. I do also okay. want to mention it is 4th of July weekend. So on Twitter, I asked people, and I'm going to ask you this same question, John. Uh, two, two pro, like, uh, I would say two... Uh, American anthems, okay, both produced by Ted Templeman. I wanted to know which one was better. Here we go. These are 80s era. Yankee Rose, which is a very, in my opinion, patriotic uh, kind of rock and roll anthem by David Lee Roth. Or I remember around that same time, actually a couple years before Yankee Rose came out, the song, not the album, the title track. Uh, the song Voice of America by Sammy Hagar, which was the second mm. single released off the Voice of America uh, record. See. Which uh, one of those do you think won the polling uh, that I did? Okay, here's the thing. As, and here I, is the I, question. In honor of 4th of July weekend, which one of these Templeman produced American hard rock anthems is better? Yankee Rose by David Lee Roth or VOA by Hagar? Who do you think won? Uh, this is not saying which song I thought was better, but I'm going to say I think Yankee Rose. Yeah, actually, we had about 10 votes. Everyone picked Yankee Rose except one person who picked VOA. So Yankee so Rose. I, I like both, both, and I love Sammy Hagar, um, yeah. and I love David Lee Roth. It's you know, it's a great pick because both are great tunes. Both have the, the vibe. Yeah, and Yankee Rose was a bigger hit. I think, like, off that Voice of America record, the VOA record by Hagar, the big hit, of course, was I Can't Drive 55. Uh, right, so, right. So I do think Yankee Rose was a, a, a bigger hit. And personally, I think it was a slightly better song, although I do love the VOA record by, by Hagar, for sure. So um, yeah, I mean, it's two two great records. They're both great. I never like to to pick. The only reason I said that I thought maybe Yankee Rose won was because I thought that song, particular song was a little more out there 
uh, with the video and everything. Uh, but but both are great, and uh, that's that. I just also want to say I, I want to thank my aunt Patty um, uh, Baylog because she is tuning into this uh, show every week religiously, and she's great. And I just wanted to thank my aunt Pat for doing that. Is that your dad's sister or your mom's? My dad's sister. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you, Aunt Pat. Cool. Thank you. Now, let me show you this guitar, guys. Now, yeah, this tell is, us about this. What is that? That's a Fender okay. Strat? It's a Fender Strat. So guess what, guys? You, you're looking behind me, okay? I'm going to do this. What do we got here? We got all Gibsons. Yes. Gibsons, and we got a couple of Epiphones up here, which are part of Gibson. So... One might ask, why do you have a Strat? Well, the reason is, is I love Strats too, and I love Fenders as well. I worked for Gibson for many years, and uh, I, I have a, uh, you know, a soft spot for Gibson, and I'm still connected with Gibson, and I love Gibson, but I also love Fenders too, because I love all guitars. I love every brand of guitars. Now, this guitar, um, the reason I love this particular guitar, it, it, there's a dual reason. One, my dad was a Fender Strat player. His name is also John Ostrowski. Not John Astronomy, but John Ostrowski. Uh, and his father was John Ostrowski, my grandfather. Now, this guitar is very similar to his Strat, which was a Strat with a mocha finish and a maple uh, neck and a what was called a large 70s headstock, which is this. This is a headstock, and this is right. a it large. Look, yeah, it's a little bigger. Yeah, so that was. Yeah, it's a little... large Fender headstock, and and the font on his strat was just like this. But there there was a. Um, I had a friend who had a father, much like me, who was in a band, and we both had the same name as our dad, John Ostrowski, and his. My friend's name was Frank Consolo, and Frank Consolo, my friend, had the same name as Frank Consolo, his father who was a great musician in my hometown area. And Frank is uh, somebody who I hope is, I think watches the show and uh, I know watches the show. And I wanted to uh, mention that this guitar is something that I got because of both Frank Consolo Sr. and Frank Consolo Jr. And it's a Fender Antigua Strat. And also because of Rand Berkey and his family. Rand Berkey, Chris Berkey, mom and dad, uh, Phyllis, um, Frank's, uh, Rand's and Chris's uh, mom, who has sadly since passed away. But um, this is what, when I was in, when, when I first started to get videos of heavy metal bands like Venom and, uh, you know, Twisted Sister, these guys helped me get those videos. And Frank and Solo had some special satellite that taped these videos off of Much Music, which was a Canadian channel. And Frank had the Antigua Strat. This is a reissue. This isn't the real thing. This is a, uh, I mean, maybe a 2000s reissue made by Fender, but you got to look up Fender Antigua, A-N-T-I-G-U-A, -A, Strat. And they do right. Telecasters. They do other finishes, P basses, maybe jazz basses. I would still love to get a bass version of this. And I'd love to get a Telecaster version of this and have the whole family of the Antigua guitars. But how cool is this finish? It's like a white Beautiful. to gray sunburst. Yeah. Beautiful. And Eric Clapton even had like a... Uh, Eric Clapton Antigua Strat that was like, you know, five grand or something like that, or maybe wow. 10 grand. But uh, how cool is this? A signature, like, a signature edition, like a, a signature? Model? Yeah. But for me, let me just tell you this. I keep going on and on because this, when when Rand Berkey told me that Frank and Solo had the Antigua Strat, that was the coolest thing. And when uh, I bought this at Rudy's Music, uh, I believe, which uh, is one of the premier music stores in New York City. And now, is this uh, back when they were on 48th Street or did you buy yeah. it? Because they're down in Soho now, right? Correct, yeah. And uh, I just was such a fan of this. My earpiece is coming out. People, I don't have like black ears, like, you know, 
like there's not something wrong with me, but there's a earpiece in, so we can hear you. So that's why I have that. Cool. Anyway, how cool is this guitar, Mark? Beautiful guitar. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever seen that guitar before. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's when it's got a it? it's got a bolt on maple neck uh, tremolo, um, three screws like um, on the tr uh, you know the holes the neck on. The, the older Fenders used to have four screws, but this is made like the '70s Fender. Great guitar. Love it, John. Beautiful and, stuff. And here's the crazy thing. This guitar, I haven't picked this guitar up in like a year. Listen to this. See if I can hit a note. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it near the mic. Still in perfect tune. Like perfect tune. I haven't picked this up in like a year. That's awesome. I, when, you, when you have like a whole bunch of guitars, you don't always give the love to each one like you should, but... Right. I love this one, and I love the finish, and it reminds me of Rand Berkey and Frank and Solo, and when I was uh, in kind of like middle school. And how many guitars how cool do you own? Do you know how many guitars you own? Uh, forty some. Forty the some. I don't know what the sum is. Right. Wow. And where are they all in that? Uh, all in the apartment? They're not all here. They're not. They're they're all mixed around. Mixed around, yeah. Secret locations, yeah. All Secret right. locations, yeah. There you go. Cool. Great stuff, <laughs> man. Great stuff. So, thanks. Um, what do you want to do? I mean, we got we got nine nine twelve. You good for another half hour? Forty. I'm good minutes? for another half hour. I wanted to. I want to ask you about another one of your brush with greatnesses. Yeah. Let me set this down. Throw any Why name, you throw any name at me? Whatever. I you will. Want. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something. Here. I'm going to Tyson. I I got them all. I got it. I'm going to ask you to do a little one minute promo while I put this guitar down. All right. Yeah, let's do it. So just talk to the talking metal uh, group and just tell them a little story. <laughs> well, okay. I'll, I'll do a promo for sure. If you're, if you're just okay. joining us, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast that we have some incredible interviews coming up uh, next week, right here on the live stream, Daryl McDaniels, one of the biggest heavy metal fans I know. Yeah, that Daryl McDaniels, DMC from Run DMC. Believe it or not, he loves metal just as much, if not more, than hip hop. Even though he in freaking invented rap and hip hip hop, or one is one of the inventors. He will be here next week. Uh, I did want to also mention on the podcast, which depending on what order we throw this up, these interviews may or may not have already aired. Uh, Klaus Mine, D. Snyder. Um, we have. Uh, Udo Dirk Schneider. So a lot of great stuff. Greg Renoff is on. We have a discussion about Ted Templeman, uh, who I just, uh, Greg wrote a book with about Ted or with Ted. It's Ted's book. He was the co-writer, kind of like John was with Ace's book. And it's an amazing read, Ted Templeman. This guy, Ted Templeman, man, he was a, like a pop star in the 60s. Then he went on to produce so many great bands. I mean, and all over the map, John, Carly Simon, uh, Bullet Boys, um, you know, Doobie Brothers, and of course, the mighty Van Halen, and just some crazy Van Halen stories in the book. So, uh, which kind of ties back to, to Randy. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that great promo. Was a half and yawn. I tried to swallow it. I'm definitely no. I did a yawn earlier, and that's yeah, right. I'm definitely a little, a little tired tonight. It, it's a weird. I thing. know. Today doesn't feel like a Friday to me. It actually yeah. feels like a Saturday because I've been, you know, it, it, it just the d dynamic of things in my life, it felt like a Saturday because a lot of people were off today. But yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. I I'll tell you the truth, guys. Um, I was a little, uh, I feel a little different today than I do on normal Fridays. And, and I think it's natural. And I think if we brought in a psychologist, they would say, okay, COVID, but when we were like, practically locked in our places there was one feeling and now there's a different feeling where you can go out but you just can't go in restaurants so for me right now things are almost the same the only difference is i can't go in restaurants but i can go and hang out outside of restaurants so, but what's weird is i don't go to work every day i work from home so that's a, an odd situation so i think we're all going through a different vibe and you know we're just evolving and 
I'm glad we're doing talking metal because I don't care if COVID's over, uh, which I'd be happy if it was over. Well, but in, I in still New Jersey, it's getting a lot metal. better, you know, but it's like, yeah. in, in uh, I don't know. Do you remember Emily's friend, uh, Laurie and Taylor? You've met him before. Yeah, right? yeah, I remember them. Yeah. They all got COVID. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that they got it, but I can't believe they got it. Jeez. Yeah, well, they were like, you know, in, they're, in, they're in Texas and they're, they're, uh, you know, they were just like, oh, yeah, we don't have to wear a mask. Everyone's going out and they're sending their kid to camp and all this stuff. It was a different vibe down there, you know, and and now it's like exploding down there. And, and uh, three of the four family members got it. So um, God, yeah, we're, we're thinking of them and hope they recover. Yeah, I hope they're OK. But I know down in the Dallas area right now, if any of you listeners are down there, that it's 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 been really uh, rough, whereas I feel like we're kind of coming out from it here which i'm very psyched about but i know different areas of the country are going through different phases yeah. of time so uh just a big shout out to everyone in the in the texas area down there then we uh, yeah we, we love texas and, and uh yeah absolutely i i i you know i i never you've toured all over the place i've never spent much time in texas and i have a lot of friends there now um but I, I've been to the airport. Uh, the, what is what is it? The airport? Dallas Fort Worth, maybe. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been to that airport like two or three times to like change flights, but right. I've never left the airport. So I yeah. I've technically been in Texas like I think three times, but I've never left that building. So yeah. I I, I want to I want to get to Texas. We, well, let, let's do a talking. Let's do this. Let's start organizing talking metal trips to gig you know we used to do interviews like where we're like in it we go down to irving plaza let's make road trip talking metal interviews just yeah, for the heck you got a lot of friends in texas and and phil in the chat just said greetings john from oh Dallas. in the in, yeah. nice do you know do you Wait, know phil? phil uh oh phil pacific phil, yeah. phil pacific my number one cool cousin phil pacific he, oh, phil so he, is my I, I would say no, no matter what, out of all the people I know, Phil is my idol. Let me tell you this. We were once at Legal Seafood and Phil and his brother, Al, and uh, the bill came in and they go, 70. And I was like, oh my God, 70. To me, it, that, that was like in like the 1990 or 1988 like or something like that. I was like, oh my God, 70. That's like $1,000 to me now. But anyway... Phil and his brother Helen and everybody. Remember when you tap they, the table, man? It's like yeah, really like okay, crazy. I won't tap the table anymore. Phil is uh, so cool, and Phil, thank you so much for watching tonight. And uh, Phil is in Texas, and we should go down there and see Phil. The last, well, I don't think know if it was the last time I was in Texas, but um, uh, Phil came to see Ace. Uh, uh, you know, we had a great time in Dallas, and. Uh, uh, it was, it's very cool. Phil, Phil is one of my closest ever relatives and, uh, I'm so glad he's watching tonight. So cool. we're going to hang out soon, Phil. Thank you for watching. And Todd Shalak, Shalik. Todd Shalik. Yeah. Todd Shalik. He is, he is uh, Todd's Sammy also is one of my longtime friends. Todd sends me amazing kiss stuff and Todd, I promise you, I'm going to get that book out to you the very next time I go to the post office. Uh, COVID has been screwing us all up. And thank you for those amazing box sets of Kiss dolls. He sent me these box sets. You got Destroyer, Love Gun, Alive 2. And the, the four figures look like the cover figures of that particular album. So it's amazing. And, and he's Todd just, sent uh, me Sammy is just plain cool. I agree with that. And David Lee Roth wears a wig. I don't agree with that, uh, Todd. Dave actually has had uh, transplant surgery, in my opinion. He's never right. admitted this. He may have at one time wore some enhancement weaves, but uh, I don't, I, I am, actually, I know for, for certain Dave does not wear a wig that, that may be some kind of surgical enhancement on his head, but he's, he's not wearing a wig. And, and quite frankly, I, a lot of these guys are wearing wigs and have had uh, <laughs> surgery. And Sammy, uh, he's not immune from this. I mean, take a look at that face. That's not the face of a 73-year-old man. That's just my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I don't know if that's Botox or surgery or whatever. But, uh, yeah. But, listen, it's all good. Whatever you got to do to, you know, it's better to, it's better to look good than, than to feel good. That's my uh, – <laughs> 
<laughs> nice little. And you know, yeah. You know what? When I drink uh, tonight, I'm not drinking Pacific beer, but when I drink Pacific beer, I think of Phil Pacific and Alan Pacific and all of the Pacific family. Um, because uh, the, my so cousin, so I'm just talking the, about those guys. Phil Pacific again is uh, your cousin? Yeah, Connie. Um, and then there's all the other Pacifics, the Pacifics, the Pacific Coast, the Pacific Cheese, there's Marky, there's uh, Francine. There's, I got a lot of great relatives. They're so cool. And, uh, and they, they're lovely. also related to Hank Reeves and, and uh, you know, that in Rini Reeves. And Todd Shalak, I got a lot of great relatives. Todd Shalak is a second cousin? No, Todd, Todd Schulich is not a cousin, but he's been to my home in Pennsylvania, and he's been to my apartment in Boston, Mass. Um, Todd's just a great friend of mine that I met in 1987 in Johnstown, Pennsylvania at the War Memorial Arena at an Ace Frehley concert. And Ooh. till this day, from 1987 until 2020, Todd Schulich and I have been friends. How about that? A big shout out to two dear friends. I love both these guys tremendously. Mike Peel is watching. Mike, uh, I was I think about you all the time, uh, thinking about your 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 beautiful pugs. I, I believe that have passed away because we are currently looking for a pug to to buy or adopt or whatever. So uh, I always loved your your dogs. Speaking of dogs, mine is barking in the background. And uh, Nick Cavanero, longtime friend of, of oh, mine. Nick, I love Nick Cavanero. We had, we had like brunch or lunch or something like right before this COVID shit all went down, Nick and I had this amazing brunch at uh, the TikTok diner in, in West Orange, which like overlooks Manhattan. And, and then I love Nick like, Kevin. Yeah. It was like a the normal, like reconnecting with a friend, you know, gave him a big hug when I saw him. And then like a week later, COVID went crazy. It was like the God. weirdest thing. Yeah, and, and yeah, thank you. Hopefully things are getting back to normal here in New Jersey. Nick, hope to see you soon. And uh, let's see, what's up, fellas? Happy Fourth. Uh, yeah, everyone checking in. It's great to it's great to see see people on the feed here. I know. I really wish I could check in and they leave the, the stream. I, I don't expect anybody to sit here and listen to two old man uh, men ramble for for two hours. But uh, I appreciate all you guys. Oh uh, well, we're having a good time, and uh, you cheers. know, Nick, uh, Nick, cheers, we gotta cheers. We got to hang out with Nick. Um, Nick is a great musician, and I always remember that about Nick. And uh, I got really a couple is. other funny stories that I remember about Nick that, that he'd laugh at if uh, we are, uh, you know, not making fun, just like inside jokes and stuff like that. And, yeah, well, the thing about uh, Nick is I don't know if he'd, he'd say it publicly, but you get him, you know, uh, uh, off mic, he has great stories like they just crack you up like about people. Yeah, didn't Nick tour with Jesse Mallon? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and like hanging out with Matt Pinfield. He he had me laughing so hard telling me about Matt Pinfield staying at his house and I won't repeat that here, but yeah. it's and is it Nick story. good friends with Rob Caggiano from Ballbeat? Yeah, I think so. Actually, Nick, if you're watching, we'd love to interview Rob here on the on the stream. We'd yeah. Like him on at some point. I ran into Rob um, at uh, Bowery Electric during a showcase and uh, talked to him for a second, and he's really cool. But uh, I know Nick's good friends with him, so Nick, yeah. Nick is a great dude, and I'm happy that Nick went on to do some amazing stuff. And uh, and he even back in the day, Nick had done some really cool stuff. Like, isn't that song "I Will Survive"? Didn't Nick play on um, who's who did "I Will Survive"? That great 70s song. Uh, Gloria Gaynor? Yeah. Is I that... believe Nick played on her album. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know. Nick, you let us know. I'm not sure about that. You may have. Who knows? Uh, yeah, he's in the chat right now. So, uh, yeah, so Nick, like did you play delay. on Gloria Gaynor's album? Yeah, there's like a minute delay. So the people yeah, will Yeah, so that'll album. come back in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. And Nick and I did a track flashback together. I think you worked on yeah. that show. And... I worked on that, I think, after you guys did. I, I remember oh, okay. Michelle and Michelle Mahoney and I worked on Flashback with Tom Kanuski and Mary Wharton, the Suzanne Summers. Oh, Mark Weiss checking in. Mark, your book right. Oh, Mark, hey, Mark Weiss. We we were talking earlier about how great your book is and I Mark it loves Father's it. Day. And my wife yeah. bought it for me for Father's Day. Awesome book. Uh, no doubt 
but yeah. Oh, Nick, Nick Cavanero says, yes, Gloria Gaynor. Correct. Cool. I, I did not know that. And now Nick Cavanero is awesome. calling me. I, Nick, I can't, I can't, we're doing a show. I can't pick up right now. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, there he's on FaceTime. Hey, Nick, Nick, I, I, we're on, we're doing the live stream, man. Can I call you back? <laughs> Cool, dude. I can't. I, I I meant to hang up on Nick, and I actually accepted the call. Nick, man, I, we're doing the live stream. Can I call you back later? Nick Cavanero, hello. Hi, Nick. I can't see him, but hello. So, Nick, you played with you played with Gloria Gaynor. Yeah, I did. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. I didn't know that. You never told me that. Yeah, when I was working at uh, uh, oh my god, that was before the MTV Networks thing, and that's how I got in, you know, from knowing Tara. Oh wow! Um, I was working at this place called Radical Records, and I was like doing faxes and this and that and all kinds of stuff. Faxes. Huh? And, yeah, and and they were doing remixes of this, and they were like, "Well, we need a guitar player to play on the uh, I Will Survive," you know, to do this remix. And they're like, well, Nick can play, and it wouldn't cost anything. So I played some funk guitar, you know, lines, you know, the the changes to the song, and and then it got sent out, and I saw nothing for it. <laughs> oh wow, okay. Nick, tell tell Nick, I don't know if he can hear me, but Nick, we we love it. I can hear you over the live stream, and it sounds great. And uh, oh, cool. see you. Uh, I love it, Nick. We got to get you out of. If you don't mind COVID, come over to my apartment one of these days. We'll do talking metal yeah, premiere. You can be. Well, we should all, you know, whatever, do an outdoor diner hang or whatever the hell they do now. They we'll know. do that. We can yeah. do an outdoor version of this. Cool. No, but it's crazy. Like Mark said, it's like we had such a good hang, and like, I don't know, two days later, it's like everybody locked down. Take it's cover. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Great. <laughs> just like yeah mark it's great seeing you sorry never see you again for, uh, <laughs> whatever it is you know hey hey nick I, i'm i'm uh if mark mark and emily they're safe because they have two beautiful kids but uh hey man astronomy's just rocking out we're, yeah. we're ready to hang we don't care <laughs> yeah but well, nick's nick i'm gonna let you go man but we'll we'll connect soon man all right all yeah. right thanks for the I'm just kidding, guys. Yeah, Nick, I'm Nick's very got safe. Two beautiful kids too. Nick, Nick's got two beautiful kids too. Oh, I didn't know. It. And uh, definitely a, a very talented guy. We we will definitely hang. But maybe we should start doing that. Just having random people that we're friends with call up in this. Call segment. in, yeah. We we can even get them to pop on video too. We should do yeah. that. Maybe like we'll have our guests and then have other people. Here's what I got, people. I have kids, but they're called they're called Les Pauls. And they are sparkly, right? And they look right great. And they have three pickups in their their custom shop, and they're worth like ten thousand each. Yeah, that's my kids. Yeah, that, no, those are that, Dan. I know you're joking. I know you're joking, but those are beautiful possessions. I know. I have but, to. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm jealous, Mark, because I wish I had like a nice family. But you know, I just got these things. Right. Well, listen. How sad is that? <laughs> I, you know, I, I I value my family so much. No, I know. There's like there's like a, every now and again I like look at you or Dan Lorenzo and I'm like, wow, my, those guys sit around and there's no screaming kids. There's no. Yeah, but here's the thing. I'm not I'm not saying that I don't want to go there. I'll just do it at a later time. You never know. Right. You know, right. I can't be like you know 80 and go. Here's my one year old kid. But you know, well, we'll see what happens. Scotty, man. Scotty from Star Trek. Jimmy du Duhan. What was his name? Duhan. He had like a kid when he was 80. Oh, see, I don't want to have a kid when I'm 80, but you know, I'm, I'm not that old yet. Could right. still do it. Well, yeah, you got, you got some time. 50. Before, right? <laughs> don't want to but admit anyways, it, but anyways, yeah, it's, it's teacher's own, man. I mean, there's good things about both. Uh, about no, no, there's, be let me tell you, there's better things about what you're doing than what I'm doing. However, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you came here for a week and and uh, we switched places for a week, you might disagree. But uh, I know. <laughs> so I, I got, I got. You know what I got to show for it? Stand by, stand by. Here we go, ladies. We need a drum roll for this, man. Anyways, did I mention D. Snyder <laughs> coming to Talking Metal, man? Great interview with D. 
no politics, just D talking rock, which is how we like to do it on uh, Talking Metal, because I know people, uh, we get sick of hearing that Blabbermouth always blows those political headlines up, which is why I try to avoid that in my interviews. But John, what do you got okay. for us? I got this. No regrets. I wrote this book with Ace Frilly. That's right. Lifelong dream. Yes, absolutely. Great read. Thisology. I helped right. with this project. I got three multi-platinum DVD plaques on the wall across from here. Um, Space Invader record. Ace Frilly. I wrote the song with Ace called Give Me a Feeling. And that is a dream come true. And no matter what, I, how crazy is that? I wrote the song. No, I mean, co-wrote the song. I was going to say I wrote it with Ace, but now I'm going to shorten that and say I co-wrote the song that was the single on an Ace Frehley record. How weird yeah. is that? The, the lead-off single on an Ace Frehley record. Such a great song. So should we do a Brush With Greatness? Yes. Okay. Mike Tyson. Brush With Greatness. Yeah, we can Go. do a few of these. The Mike Tyson one is really short. Um, okay, we'll but, do a couple. Do it. Mike Tyson. I was at a party uh, and... Mike Tyson showed up and he came in and he, it was, it was so, it, it was so explosive. Like there were rock stars there and everyone was like Mike Tyson. And he was literally running through the party because everyone was chasing him. Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers was like, Mike, Mike. And this is like in the nineties when the Chili Peppers were enormous, but people were going berserko for Mike so much so that he literally ran through the party and left. It was like, wow, absolutely incredible to see celebrities going nuts for Mike Tyson. The truly, I mean, you and I grew up in a, in a different era. Boxing was the, was, I mean, amazing. I mean, it was just like such a big thing in the seventies and eighties and Mike took it into the 90s he was truly the last of an era the the last superstar world famous uh heavyweight champion i mean the the last of an era can you name a heavyweight championship boxer since mike tyson no yeah he was the last and people are like well he went crazy got into drugs and bit some guy's ear off and yeah all that's true but <laughs> you know his name you know his name, and he was the last of a uh, of an era. And a good friend of mine works with with Mike Tyson, and and I I truly respect that man, one hundred percent. And I know there's been some real sketchball stuff in his past, but I think where Mike Tyson is now is is he's he's a very um, stable guy now, and I, I really believe he came through. A, a really hard time and and listen I, i'll just shut up i've had a few beers but oh, I, that's good that's good you know, okay I know this is controversial but i have a lot of respect for mike tyson right I do. right well we we um we're, we stand behind anybody who is working hard to get on the right page no matter where they were once at right no matter, yeah no matter where they put a tattoo on their face speaking of uh, <laughs> facial tattoos tell me lee yeah, and I want to get your honest opinion on this. He's older than we are. He was the youngest guy in Motley Crue. He's, and I get it, you know, Post Malone and stuff. Well, I respect right. Post Malone. He's yeah. got the facial tattoos and stuff. But really, Tommy, you got to put a fucking facial tattoo. What is that? I don't know. I looked at it and I was like, I wasn't shocked. I was just like, I kind of like was like, oh, brother. Like when Mike Tyson put the thing on his face, I was like, whoa that's some crazy shit first time i saw like you know um some of these what's that rapper who had all the face tattoos uh, not post malone the other one the afternoon yeah. oh takashi 69 no 69 the one no i can't remember his name but i uh, anyways i was shocked something was 69 like, i don't know yeah no no not that guy a different guy he was like a superstar guy but uh, anyways the facial t tattoos were initially really shocking to me like i like right. I, and and it's probably the same way like somebody in the 60s was when somebody showed up with long hair or something. But right, right. But the Tommy Lee thing, like, what's your take on it? My thing is Tommy Lee's so cool. I don't think he needed to go to facial tattoos to do a cooler thing. However, 
thankfully they're on the sides, not like in the front. Uh, in my opinion, no offense to Post Malone or anybody else, because I do also like Post Malone. But I wouldn't want to get anything in the front because here's the thing. I, I might like this shirt today and I might think it's idiotic tomorrow and I don't want to do anything that you can't get rid of, you know, like a face tattoo. Now, right. Tommy Lee, the one side's like some Asian characters. It kind of looked cool to me. I don't know what it says. Uh, and that's the thing, guys, When you, if you're going to get some like foreign language on your face, make sure it doesn't say I'm a freaking idiot like you know like so i don't think tommy lee said that but um you know tommy lee's tommy lee and he has right. people who are heavy duty people working for him if i go to the tattoo parlor and go hey right john is cool on my face they might write something else and i won't know any different so uh, i would i would refrain from doing that if i were any of the listeners or viewers and uh i don't think it was necessary for tommy lee to do it but um they're kind of on the side. The the one on the other side, I, I forgot what it was, but I'm not, I, I don't think Tommy Lee had anything to prove. So I wish that, I don't know. I mean, if he's happy with them, great, but I don't think it was necessary. I like Tommy Lee with or without face tattoos. Right. And I don't think it's, I, I don't think he needed to do it. Let me just say it right. that way. Is that I, nice enough to say? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally nice, but I, I, I just, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like, and I love, love Tommy Lee so, so much. Like, I think he's, I think he's a badass in so many different ways, but right. like, it's just like, come on, dude. You're like, you're in your, you're in your fifties and yeah. Yeah. No it's reason, just like, there's no reason why he, he, he shouldn't have got it. I mean, I don't, I'm not being a Debbie Downer. Cause again, I, I support him and love him, but I personally, and I hate to say this, because again, I, I sometimes get negative after I've had a couple drinks, but it seems like he's trying a little too hard. Right, right. And, and, and here's again, the thing, Tommy Lee does not need to, if there's any dude on the planet, I'm gonna just say this right now, this is gonna get a little weird. If there's any guy on the planet that does not need to try hard, it's Tommy Lee. Yeah, just drop his pants. He can prove you. That, that's what I was gonna say. All, all you all gotta to do, do is watch that one video. Yeah. <laughs> Pamela Anderson. Now, guess what? If I was Tommy Lee, I'd be like, look, I'm Tommy Lee. I'm entering the room. I don't care if you hate me or not, but guess what? You know. Right. <laughs> but you know that video that came out of Pamela and, and Tommy Lee? Um, I was working at VH1 and I was, uh, Emily's here in time for this yeah, X rated story. <laughs> Emily, hey, it's good, good to come in right now. We're talking about, oh, that was nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I needed to do that before I talk about this X-rated story. But, uh, <laughs> so I was, this is, oh, Pearly's here. Let me get another uh, beer or something for this one. Yeah, but I oh. was at, we're going to be Hi, Emily. And, and we were um, working on a show called The 100 Most Shocking Moments of Rock. And they, right. they assigned me a bunch of, uh, I did like, I wrote and produced like 10 of the 100. And they were like, Oh, and by the way, you're doing the Pam and Tommy tape. So that was oh. my assignment. So I, I, I sat in my office. In, and in watched my, it? My windowed office. And I, I would be pressing pause, taking notes on it, on the 18-minute the video or whatever it was. Right. And that was my assignment to... Uh, to Did people walk by your office and see like a screen capture? Saw a big penis. Pause? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, big boobs, big penis. They were... They were yeah. It was all there, and uh, so I know that I, I could probably, by memory, walk you through that entire 18 yeah. minutes. See, if I was Tommy Lee, you don't have to prove anything to anybody after that video. Like, oh, I'd be like, nothing to prove. But I will say, when I did the final piece, my favorite part was, there was one time when he pulled down his Speedo and his penis went like this, bing, and I added a sound effect that went, bing. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have a Pam Anderson story. Do you remember? You have a remember? Tommy Lee story too. Oh, oh let's hear a brush with greatness, Tommy Lee, Emily. I do. I do. Oh, this is crazy. Come up forward. Come I forward. I know the Pamela Anderson one, so I want to hear that. So, Mark, I, oh, I, let I, Emily come and sit closer. Oh, all right. Yeah, we can so, oh, no, no, no. It's cool. Yeah. So my Tommy. I just said, I didn't mean leave, Mark. I just meant like share the seat. 
so my yeah my Tom Lee story. So I you uh I I was in Miami for work, and I'm in my business suit. I'm and we said you know what before the meeting starts let's go sit by the pool, let's just go sit by the pool. And so me and my coworkers I was like in my late twenties I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know if we were married or not yet. No, I think we were just engaged. Yeah, I was you, in. Yeah, yeah. I was in my late twenties, and then my coworkers were probably in their forties and fifties, and we're all sitting around the pool at, at was it the Ritz Carl? It was a nice hotel in. I in like the Ritz Carltons. They're good. And <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> I look over, and that it was empty. The pool area was empty, but Tommy Lee was just sitting like maybe like 20 feet away from me and I got on my cell I got on my I, I turned to my co-workers who had no clue who Tommy Lee was no Back. clue none whatsoever and I was like oh I'm actually a really big fan of his I I they're like well go say hi go say hi and I was like I don't know I don't know I don't know and I called Mark I called you didn't I I called Mark on my cell and I'm like Tommy Lee is like sitting 20 feet away from <laughs> me at the pool and he's like, you gotta go say hi. And he was there promoting his book. It was before the dirt. That was after the dirt. It was like wait, it was the no. Tommy, yeah, it was the Tommy Land book. It was it was after the dirt. It was the Tommy Land. Book. No, that was before the, the dirt. dirt. No, the dirt was long before I ever knew you. So the dirt was like um okay, then I'm confused. Yeah. So it was Tommy Land. Sorry, it was his. It was his book. So long story short. This was before selfies. This was a flip phone, but I have a picture of it. I'm going to send oh it to Oh, my you. God. You got to send it to me. I was like, Tommy, I'm a huge fan. And I'm wearing a suit, by the way. And he's wearing a I suit. like it. He, he, he I love that. He was like a Speedo. He was naked. And I'm wearing a suit <laughs> at the pool. And I'm like, I'm here for work. I'm from New York City. I'm a huge fan. I said, I can't wait to. And, and once I told him that. Once he knew that I knew about the book, the Tommy Land book uh -huh. he was promoting, he was like, he loved me, right? Nice. I like, Can I try and get a picture? So we we did like a selfie with that, like with a flip with phone. With a flip phone? Kind of That's guessing. amazing. It was like, you're kind of guessing like where to hold it. And um, he's like, so I own a club here in Miami and you should come later. You should come to the club later. And I was like, okay. <laughs> wow yeah so i get invited to this club tommy lee's club and but like i didn't know what time to go or anything so like i went like really early and i and the guys at the door were like oh you know we're not even open yet and i was so embarrassed because i guess it's like some one of these late night clubs meanwhile she had an 8 a.m meeting the next morning yes back. <laughs> i was there for work for work, for work, for work. So anyway, long story short, I told the guys at the door, I was like, I met Tommy earlier and he invited me here. And they were like, oh, he's he's having dinner. He's gonna be having dinner with a group across the street. Why don't you go? Wow. <laughs> so I went across the street and just kind of hung out at the bar. And like 20 minutes later, Tommy Lee walks in with a giant entourage. And there was this a table of like 20 people set up. And I was just too embarrassed and I took off and left. No, that's oh, not, no. That's not yes. exactly true. You sat at the table with them for a little bit. For like you called me and you're like, I'm at the table, but I have my 8 a.m. meeting. It's weird. I don't know anyone. But but did he know you no. were at the table? No, because I kind of sat at the table. I was like, I'm here you know, Tommy Lee, blah, blah, blah. And so they, they're like, oh, here's his table over here. And they sat me. And then he walked in with his entourage and I was realizing how late it was. And I just felt embarrassed and weird, even though he'd invited me. I mean, he invited me to the club. He didn't really invite me to dinner, but the people at the club invited me to the dinner. So. Yeah, right, right. So you did I the right thing. That's I great. Did. I would have been God. I didn't even, hey, John, I Run did not even say hi to him. I did not even say hi. I like ducked out. I was like, oh, God, because I just felt weird. It was just weird. So, well, yeah. I think it's a great story, but well, here's what we got to do we got to arrange to meet with Tommy Lee sometime. 
And I bet, it, believe me, that sounds far-fetched, but it's not that far-fetched. We can do it. Mark, Emily, me, Tommy Lee, he's we'll bring... Uh, to get, yeah, unless, unless you're corporate media, he is, it's like... Motley Crue are like uh, Metallica. They, they don't. Yeah, they they're super. Except yeah. for Mick Mars, who I could right. I tell you my Mick Mars story. Yeah, okay, brush for greatness, Mick Mars. Come up, come, bring so, your chair up a little oh, yeah. bit. Mick Mars, Mick Mars. But I have I have another. I have a Pam Anderson. Oh, tell story. them. Oh, I want to hear that oh, one too. I, I don't no, even can, know the Pam Anderson. No, no, no. Can you <laughs> can you guys share the seat or no? Can you sit on each other's lap maybe? Yeah, that's no, all right. Pull this thing up. Oh yeah. God! Help! Um, Let, no, no, I didn't meet Pam. Sit on a stool. But I interviewed someone for Talking Metal who will rename, remain nameless. Okay. Until I'm talking to you guys offline. Um, but he's like, "Oh, I have a Pam Anderson story." So, do you guys remember who Pam Anderson was married to after Tommy Lee? Kid uh, Rock. Kid Rock. That magician guy. Oh, really? Well, she's been married like six or seven times. Right? No. Kid Rock, right? You're talking about yeah. Kid Rock. Right, yeah, Kid I'm Rock. I'm talking about Kid Rock. What so, was that, like for like 10 days or something? I mean, that was short. I don't know, but they were together a long time. I was there the day that Pam met Kid Rock. I'm telling I you, was, for real. Really? I was, where, yeah. where was that? The, the VH1 Divas or something like that? Yeah, I worked it, for that show. I was one of the yeah. producers on that show. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I was at that Reason show Reason. at Radio City. And I remember seeing Pamela like in the aisle while like, walking to my seat. And I'm like, oh my God, look at her. She, like she looked pretty hot. I was there. I was there. I worked that show. It was 90, That's awesome. It was like 90. I was there and you were there. I don't know. I don't, I, if you were working, I probably didn't see you because you were working, but I, I just was there watching. But I got tickets, you know, through work. It was a great show, man. Lenny Kravitz, Aretha Franklin. Yeah. I, I, you know, real quick, I stood next to David Bowie, but I didn't say anything to him because I didn't want to, like, you know, cause any trouble. You didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. So I just was like, oh my God, I'm standing by David Bowie. How Love freaking cool is this? I love that song. <laughs> but but let, me, let me finish my story quickly and then I'll let him go into his McMahon story. So I was interviewing someone for Talking Metal a while back and we, I always talk to my guests and so does Mark offline, right? We're talking offline. Right. We'll hang out, whatever. And a story came up about Pam Anderson and Kid Rock and they were doing some kind of date together, this particular person. And I don't know if they were doing a festival together or a date together, but he basically was like, Hey, Hey, come on, come on in my, my, onto my tour bus. I want to show you something and took this person onto the tour bus, walk him, walked him to the back bedroom of the tour bus and opened the door and it was Pam Anderson, buck naked, asleep. Asleep! And he just wanted to show. And it was Kid show. Rock who did it? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I never told you that. Uh, you may have. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you who the, the, the guest was, but it was- That was a male guest that it was saw a male that. male guest. And and Kid Rock basically was like, "Come here, I want to show you my." Check name. out Pamela Anderson naked in the back of my bus. Yes, it happened, and I'm probably gonna get in trouble for telling the story. Uh oh. But yeah. hey, I you guys know that my early Rock Soft MTV appearances were with Kid Rock, right? Yes, and Matt Pinfield. And Matt Pinfield, how cool was that? I don't know if these are too much. It's kind of dorky. No, keep them on the market. It's rocking, oh, rocking. Those are yeah. good shades. Well, I just can't rock see. and roll like forever. Blind. Rock and roll this looks forever. Like a blind man would wear these because his eyes are like going in different directions, and he doesn't want people <laughs> to see that. That's actually how I am with them on. I'm legally blind. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, my Mick Mar story. Speaking of the crew, is I mean, and John and I have the most amazing Nikki Six story. But um, yeah, yeah, no Mick doubt Mar, about it. The, the Mick Mar story is carmine who we know friend of friend of ours carmine a, a piece a piece uh great greatest drummers really of of, of rock yeah one of the greatest all-time drummers of all time he said uh he had this uh, guitar zeus album that he was promoting and mick played on it so he was re re reissuing the album that it had come out a number of years ago and last year was it last year or was it the year before it may have been 2018 i i'm not really sure um Although it could have been 2019. I don't know. Yeah, I think it was 2019, actually. 
he he tells me he was like like well i'm gonna ha i'm gonna want you to interview some people from uh, the guitar zeus album he's like yeah doug aldridge and a oh, bunch of other people that no one really would care about and none of them call me back like like wow. seriously I, I i doug aldridge i'm like carmine wants me to interview you about the uh, no response whatsoever um <laughs> Mick Mars, all of a sudden I get a call and it's coming. It says, it says, my look at my phone, it says caller ID Malibu, California. I'm, well, like, I'm like, who's that? I'm like, I, that that might be a spammer, but Malibu, I don't usually get. Yeah, spammers. I'll pick up, right? You picked up? Usually the spammers are like, you know, like, like weird, like Texas numbers and stuff. So I pick it up <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, hello? And he's like, hello? I'm like, Who's this? He's like, is it Mick? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, uh, I'm like, Mick who? <laughs> he goes, you see that like Jagger? Jagger? Goes, Mick Mars. <laughs> this is Mick Mars. And I was like, I was like, Mick, oh my God. And I like run upstairs because like the kids were yelling and stuff. I would have been like, Mick Mars. Like, what? I'm like, I'm like, Mick, how are you? You know, and he's like, He's like, yeah, Carmine said to call you. He's like, what do you want? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Mick, it's an honor to speak with you. I said, are you calling from Malibu? He's like, no, I moved to Ma Nashville, but I still got the Malibu number. He's like, fuck California. <laughs> like, and I was like, I was like, oh. And he was like, he was like, so you want to, you want to interview me? And I was like, yeah. He goes, talk about gu guitar Zeus. And then I was like, yeah, definitely, let's do it. And he was like. He's like, what song did I play on? What's it called? Yeah. And I was like, uh, and I told him the name of the song. He's like, okay. Uh, he's like, you got a few minutes. I'm going to go listen to the song and then we can talk about it. I'm like, no, Mick, I'm, I'm on my cell phone right now. I can't do the interview right now. And he's like, oh, when do you want to do it? And I was like, tomorrow? And he's like, perfect. He's like, call me back tomorrow. And I was like, what time? <laughs> he's like, what time you want to do it? And I was like, 12 noon, your time, or 12 noon, Nashville time? He's like, perfect. He's like, call me that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. That, Mark, I think that might be one of the greatest ever talking metal stories. I'm not even kidding. I, I mean, we say. had an amazing story with Nikki Six that was handled by other people. And and that's still, I mean, I no still one. Have a cell phone number in my phone. We could literally, just like Nick Cabanero was on the line, we could literally right, we, call Mick Mars right now. We should, like, but one of these days, we should just call. do a thing where we try to call people and see who picks up. Yeah. But like that, that is insane. If I got a call from Mick Mars of Motley Crue, I'd be like, I've went to heaven. This is okay. The, the fact that you were, you, it didn't trigger in your brain when he said Mick. You were like, Mick who? Well, because like, Carmine had said, all these yeah. guys are going to call you, D right. Doug Pinnock. And, and I like, I tried emailing some of them and, and calling right. some of them. And it was like, not, not, no one was responding. And then Rick Derringer responded. There was a Oh, that's cool. Rick Derringer's great. Yeah, great bass player, Tony. Uh, Tony Mark? No. Uh, forgot his name. Levin, Tony, Tony Levin. Franklin. No, Tony Franklin. He Tony was, Franklin of the yeah. firm. Oh, my God. That guy's great. Yeah. He was actually a really good interview, but a lot of them didn't respond. And, and they were like, really, I mean, no offense to Doug Aldridge, but not big names. Uh, and then here, the biggest star ever, like, calls Call. me on my cell phone. Yeah. And that was the yeah. highest downloaded show of Talking Metal from 2019. It's like... I believe it. I believe it. 18,000 downloads well, or something let's crazy. let's be honest. Mick Mars doesn't do interviews. And it was... Right, right. This is a rare thing. Yeah, Mick Mars. Oh, my God. He doesn't do interviews. And it was before Mick the Mars. dirt. And all the dirt interviews were being done by Tommy Lee and Nikki Six because they were... Right. They were producers on it and i remember during the interview the dirt was like airing two weeks later i was like so how, how did how, are you happy with the way the dirt turned out and he was like well it's all right yeah, I, I think the fans will like it you know it is what it is like he was like and i was like oh my god like i thought that was going to be the blabbermouth headline they they went with like something else but has anyone uh, heard how his health is has it lately i hope it's all right because you know we we have 300 the, four, the tour four, coming up invested in tickets <laughs> so yeah yeah but God, I have not. I, now i i have uh i mean here's the thing Let, for people who do not know our history i'm gonna quickly say that mark and i got in a car with nikki six at the gans divorce hotel down in the meatpacking district of new york city and took that car up to times square where we went to a book signing 
and had a rocking day with Nikki Six, and that was insanely cool. And he said some great things about us because of his previous um, research on us, which is basically people we work with, like Mike Davis and um, and Melissa would tell Nikki Six about what we were doing, and then he watched a little bit and said that he thought what we were doing was really cool. Right, and it was. So, it, it, he had a quote. It was the coolest effing thing, and he yeah. goes, "I think you guys are gonna go far with what you're doing." And for Nikki Six to say that about us, that's a right. big deal. And that it was, was a cool. big deal. And, and to set it up, we had a TV show on the Fuse Network, and Nikki Six uh, agreed to have us show for him up to his book signing at the Virgin Mega Store in Times Square, right. middle of Times Square. Really big deal. And so John and I, we get in the, the, the car with Nikki. I think it was like an SUV or something. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. a camera crew sitting in front of us in the car. So it was, a, it was like a van or something. And the three of us are on this seat. Yeah, it was like a, a, a SUV or van. And, and we drive from, was that, was that Soho? That was, uh, that was the meat Yeah, pack. below how, it was the, yeah, it was it was the, the meat pack. It was like near the right. gas light, down from the gas light. Yeah, right across from that, that the Soho Hotel there. And we drive right. up to Times Square. Now that, you know, Manhattan's small, but we said, it took us like an hour to go like right. four miles. And I remember, you know, they, they cut that down to like a, a, a eight minute package or less for the, the Fuse show. But it was, but I remember at one point I was like, "We're stuck in traffic with Nikki Six. I've asked every question I can think of, and I was like, I was like, how do we keep the conversation going? I said, do we not? Do we do we be quiet and let? Nikki <laughs> I don't even remember what happened. It got it got dogs? awkward. Did it got you, awkward. Did you ask about his dogs? Oh, probably. No, I don't know. I mean, seriously. Yeah, I mean, we had a blast. The, the craziest thing is that once we got there, like all these fans were in the, the uh, Virgin Megastar was multiple levels, ground level and two levels down. So you have to, we first they escorted us into like a backstage room. And then, and, and I remember we got our book signed, like stuff signed there. And then they take us down these staircases and fans are waiting in the bottom level. And here comes Dickie Six. And people are going like, ah, Nikki Six. But right behind Nikki Six are me and you. And I just went like, <laughs> all right. Yeah. John thought they were screaming for him. <laughs> and but it's really funny because there's a video. Were you on an escalator moving? Up? Yeah, we were on an escalator coming down. coming down. But what's yeah. great is that one of the uh, somehow Fuse got a hold of a fan who posted like a YouTube video of that. And so. There is actual footage of Nikki Six coming down the escalator and all his people cheering, and then right behind him are Mark and I, and I'm just like going, like <laughs> you know, rock and roll, like like we're in Molly Crew or something like that. Right. So it was really funny, and nobody was mad at us for that, but it was just a fun thing, and we did some packages. I got paddled by a dominatrix uh, that day um, on video. At, 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 yeah, at the Nikki Six book signing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see that, you can go to our YouTube page and find that somewhere. So, so those, I'm sure it's on it. covered three of the four members of Motley Crue. I can tell some, yeah. some Vince Neil brush oh, greatness if you want. Vince oh, tell Vince Neil. And I have, I, I want to quickly just, I want to tell you one thing that you may not know of real quick before we get into the Vince Neil, because I love Vince Neil and we're not going to end this. We're going to make this from this point on Motley Crue on. Only Motley Crue stories. So there was a um, a thing where Motley Crue did a thing for MTV, and they were in the studio, and they had a bus parked out in front of 1515 Broadway, like a double-decker bus, and the people on the bus got to look in through the glass at the studio. Okay? Wow. So you can picture that, right? Yeah. So I was in there somehow hanging out with Jesse Camp, and um, I was literally on stage with Motley Crue while they were playing for this audience who was watching from a bus. And I think Tommy Lee or Jesse, uh, no, I think Jesse poured like a bottle of, or a glass of water on my head, but I, you know, and I'm all protective of my wacky hair, but uh, they poured a bottle on my head, but I was literally, 
it was me, Jesse, and Tommy Lee, and we were on stage during the gig. How crazy is that? Yeah, wow, that's great. That's great. And that's yeah, on video, yeah. and you can look that up on YouTube. And I recently did it, and I saw it, but I was literally on stage with the band Motley Crue during that, and that's my Tommy Lee, Jesse Camp story. And then I did uh, interview Vince uh, at Rock Honors in the astronomy outfit. How fucking idiotic is that? Right, and we sorry and we for have, saying the F word. That, uh, we have we had a uh, audio of that somewhere, but uh, yeah, my Vince story. I have numerous Vince stories. But with Vince, uh, I mean, I saw him solo. Emily and I saw him solo of BB Kings. I've, I've seen him solo m numerous times. Uh, my, Vin my, my most memorable Vince story, and again, there are a few of them, are when I, I was a PA at MTV News. Now, back in the 90s, MTV News, like when I worked at VH1. I don't know what PA is. Okay, production assistant. So nice, uh, Emily. Very good. <laughs> v VH1, like when I worked at VH1, it was cool, but MTV was cool, and MTV News was the coolest. The, like, they're, the coolest they're, thing, right? Yeah. Chong, chong, yeah. Chong, chong. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Ding, 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 so, ding. I, I worked at MTV News, and and we were working on a like a show called "It Came from the '80s Part Two. Metal. Part Two, the Metal Years, right? Metal goes pop, and oh, yeah. they. Uh, so, anyways, we interviewed all those guys. And so Slaughter, this is 96, 1996. Slaughter, Warrant, and Vince Neil were playing at some bar, club, way the fuck out in Long Island. So I brought Terry with me, our good friend Terry Tyler. Good guy, boy. Time friend of mine. Uh, and we, we <laughs> drove out with some- Ranger other X. Other people <laughs> um, who were also nobodies at MTV News to the show. And we had full hookup and- uh, they Janie Lane was there and and they said they he was like oh my god the guys from MTV are here bring them back so Janie comes he's like how are you Mark how are you and he brings me back pre selfies pre any of that no pictures no documentation we go back and it was the backstage area was actually outside the club and there was a couple tour buses parked and um we're back there and Janie's like, this is Dana Strum, and like, and he's introducing me to wow. all these people. And and Janie was the coolest, coolest guy. So That's awesome. Heard. And Vince, uh, Dana Strum had a boombox, and he was like, he had the shout at the devil tape, and he was like trying to learn the songs. And I was like, I was like, what happened? And Dana goes, eh, Vince punched out his bassist last night, and <laughs> and Rob, I was like, who? Robbie Crane is like, yeah, Robbie Crane. They sent him home. Vince punched him in the face. Uh, I got to play tonight. I'm, <laughs> I'm playing with Vince. So I'm not having it. Robbie Green. That, I love him. That, that Dana Strum ever played with Vince Neil. I was at that show, and he played with him probably every every show since. So Robbie Crane, yeah, great guy by the way. And we actually, I actually told Robbie Crane this story, and and uh, and so um, <laughs> and Robbie's totally cool. We love Robbie. But anyways, then so so Dana's there. I'm with I'm with Janie. You got you can Terry can can confirm all this. Wow. And all of a sudden Vince Neal comes up and he's like, he's like, and Janie's like, hey Vince, this is Mark from MTV. And I'm like, hey, Vince, longtime fan, shout at the devil. He's like, hey, how are you, man? Good to see you. Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he's like sipping a beer. He's like, looks like he's pregnant. He's so he had this like massive belly. pot belly. And 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 I was like, so, so. I said, your basis is out tonight. He's like, yeah, fuck that guy, man. I don't give a shit about any of this. He's like, I got some big news, man. I got some big news. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I was like, uh, does it have to do with your old band, band members? And he was like, yeah, maybe, maybe. Stay tuned, man. And I was like, oh, wow, cool. And he was like, he was like, man, Tommy Lee's been in the press a lot lately. And he's like, yeah, fuck, fuck you. Because our kids are asleep, right? Yeah. He's like, he's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, I swear on my life. And I've never heard this. This is this yeah, I'm, I'm leaning in to hear this he goes he goes yeah he's all over the press with, with me. he goes he goes fuck her he's like he's like because i did and i was like i was like what and he was like he's like i fucked pamela he's like nikki this is the and i swear yeah. he said this i don't know if it's true because nikki fucked pamela he goes tommy marries her he's like who cares <laughs> man and i was like i was like oh and that's what he said to me and i've never ever heard anything about Nikki having any relationship with her anywhere right. 
So I don't know. I, I have a feeling he just, I don't think what he told me was true. My gut feeling is he was just trying to. Who knows? To, but, but that's what he said to me. And I, I will put my wow. hand on the Bible for that. Yeah. Then he plays the show and it's a disaster. Like after it was Slaughter played first, they were good. Warren hung out. It was, Dana Strum was in Slaughter, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Slaughter so he was first. playing and learning the Vince Dill lines so he can do that. And he too. did great. Warren played. They were awesome. And then, um, then uh, Vince came out. And he was so wasted. He had a like a bottle of champagne. I remember at one point he took his shirt off and his belly was so big. And he took the champagne and he poured it over his head. And people were leaving. And he like, was rolling. You said he was rolling on the ground. Yeah, he was rolling on the ground. And people were <laughs> flicking him off, like, fuck you, Vince. Cause he was he was not even trying. And Terry and I were cracking up. And he takes the mic, he goes, Fuck everybody. I'm back in Motley Crue. And, and like <laughs> And we were like, what? He's back in Motley Crue? And then, like, maybe, like, three months later, they were like, Vince Neal's rejoined Motley Crue. <laughs> and, and he came back. And, and you know, this is pre-internet, so that stuff never – it wasn't <laughs> YouTube or anything. And, but I swear to God, he was like, fuck everyone, I'm back in Motley Crue. <laughs> Does and he? he like, I like that. I, he, he let me say. Back, and his, his pot belly was gone. And and he, he got lipo. I don't know lipo'd. what happened, but his pot belly was gone. And then then like a year later, uh, actually, I, I think like Michelle Mahoney and I from VH1, we got invited to Letterman, and they like debuted their new the reunion tour on Letterman. They played one right. song. Right. I remember that song. I remember that. Uh, Fred, and, I think they played, and then they played like six songs after the cameras went out. Out right. on the street was closed down. And uh, they they sounded great, and and Vince was absolutely back in Motley Crue. That was like less than a year after the uh, Long Island debacle. Thank God. But he here's the thing: lost um, forty pounds in that in that. To time. me, um, let me just say this: I I love Vince Neil, and I think that I think that uh, you know I, I can see myself doing that if I were Vince Neil, and if I were in his situation, I might have done the same thing. So. Uh, and I've I've done similar things even in my like it, uh, you know, entourage days. Going, hey, I'm astronomy. I'm back and like it. Ah, I'm yeah, I'm back and like it. <laughs> you, gotta, you people. Yeah. You gotta give it to Vince. You gotta give yeah, it to right. Vince. Just, yeah, Vince knows great. Shit about what other people think. He does his own thing. And I. I yeah. Do you ever see John the video of Vince Neil and and Nicolas Cage where like from maybe like two three years ago where they're in Vegas and they're like stumbling around and then they start. Oh yeah, Nick Cage. Yeah, no, that was great. That was great. And I think Nicholas Cage was trying to fight Vince Neil for a little bit or something, right? Or, or somebody was trying to fight somebody. They're and that like was hugging each other, and then they start fighting, and then they like yeah, fight yeah. some other guy, and then they that's that's the other, normal thing in the astronomy, you know, lifestyle. You know, yeah. I'm used to that. Right. <laughs> right on, man. Well, it's ten oh eight. I thought that was great. I did. Let me tell you this, real, 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 real fast. I was in Long Island also. And I was hanging out with um, Lydia Chris, Jeanette Fraley, um, uh, and Bill Coyne. And uh, Vince Neil uh, came up, and it was a show that was a Van Halen show, and Vince Neil Band was opening up. Remember that tour? Um, yeah. So that was that when he opened for Van Halen? Yeah, that that was the yeah. Sammy Hagar, I believe, was in the band, and um, that was when Vince had that brand new cool album came out with the nice cover. Uh, yeah, so that would have uh, been Steve I, Stevens was on guitar. That? Steve Stevens on guitar. Steve Stevens was on guitar, yeah, right? That's the Bill like, Coin connection because yeah, that's why Bill Coin was there, right? Yeah, Bill Coin. And I was backstage, and I remember I got to meet Alex Van Halen, and I got to meet Sammy Hagar. That day, I didn't meet Eddie Van Halen, but um, I got to meet Alex and Sammy Hagar, and then uh, I was hanging with Bill Coin and Vince, Vince came up. I got to talk to him, which is great, and Steve Stevens, and uh, um, well, you I know, love that Vince Neil record, by the way. I thought it was a great record. Oh, yeah. Vince had Vince's solo stuff has mostly been really good. I mean, the, the connection there was Bill Coin. Um, Place Steve Stevens and Billy Idol's band. You know that was right. that was Bill Coin's mm -hmm. move. 
you know, and of course the two biggest acts Bill ever managed was Kiss and Billy Idol. And, and Billy right. uh, speaks very, in Billy's autobiography, which I've read, I need to go back to that actually, I've read bits and pieces of it, um, it speaks very highly of Bill O'Coin. In, in that yeah state. and th that was a great day and thanks to bill and Coyne for helping us. that's the only reason we were all backstage was because of bill and Coyne got us hooked right. up with that yeah, well, we, so we anyway that some... was that was another little mini vince neal story yeah yeah anyways so we could we could go on all night about uh stories and we, we got we'll, we'll tell our steve stevens story next time yeah it's including that. well, that'd be cool bug, including the bug that i found backstage and i made his roadie take it outside so oh, that, it was what? That, sort of, yeah. It's a, it was what? What did you find? A bug. I found a giant bug at, at backstage, and I made Ooh. I made his roadie take it outside instead of. I would have done that too. Yeah. I would myself. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> All right. All right, John. Well, it's good uh, speaking with you as always, and thank you. Yeah. For the, uh, Mark, what about this? Okay, we, well, we got next. Next week, we got a, another show that we're going to have to keep really legit because we got Daryl McDaniels of Run DMC, and we've got Christopher from Accept, and we got a great uh, show. So we're going to kind of keep that on the level as Square, uh, uh, not Square, Square Hammer, uh, Ghost would say. But um, <laughs> we might want to do one wacky show sometime where we're from some outdoor bar. What yeah, do you think definitely. of that? Oh, and, and Bert Gabriel says, talk about any experiences or if you have ever met former WWE champion Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I do like that, uh, Bert Gabriel, because I actually have met him and I do have stories on that, but that'll have to wait <laughs> until another episode. So, yeah. We'll um, remember it, Bert. Yeah. And, and it's pretty uneventful, but I did have a brief encounter with him. And, and anybody who's made a comment that we haven't commented on, I promise you I will read them and then I will respond in another way, either by physically responding to the comments or uh, addressing it on another episode. Because my, my other computer went off. I got like three screens going plus a phone, which is in a different room. And uh, it's a little, uh, the technology is a little crazy, but... Um, what I do is I focus on a different monitor so I can see Mark and Emily and our guests. So uh, that's why I'm not always looking at the side monitors, you know? Right on. All right, man. So, um, yeah, a lot of comments. I think Sorry. we did another good one, guys. I think we did another good show. Thanks to Randy Rand of Autograph, one of our favorite fans. And uh, thank you, Emily, for being uh, so cool. And Mark, thank you. Thanks, John. As All well. right. You guys good? Bye, John. Thanks to Grant and Harrison for keeping uh, the family together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, man. All right. Bye, Have guys. Thank yeah. you, the Talking Metal viewers and listeners and the like. That doesn't even mean anything, but I'm going to say it. Look at this wingspan I got, man. I'm like that that bird that picks up the shark in, in uh, oh, <laughs> Myrtle <laughs> Beach. Like, show me that video. Viral video. Isn't that cool? All right. Rock on. Dash vodka. Talking metal. All right. All right, John. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Keep rocking.